Okay, Ashley, can I have a roll call, please? Jordy? Aye. Oh, here. Erickson? Here. Briggs? Here. Cavalier? Here. Cresswell? Here. Black? Here. Beth Bratton? Here. Melvin? Here. Got you off guard, Christy? Yeah, right. sorry. <laughs> Okay, this time for the open forum. If anyone would like to address council on any issue not on tonight's agenda, may come to the podium. State your first and last name and address, please. Hearing none from chambers. Chad, anybody on the phone bridge, please? Uh, not, this night. not tonight, Your Honor. I will close the bridge. Thank you. Agent logged off. Uh, we have one presentation and one public information announcement tonight. Uh, start with Porky. Yes, I would like to um, have Jordan Burquist come to the podium. Um, last meeting, you expressed a desire to meet some of our new employees. Jordan is our human resources director. Uh, he's been on the job a few months now, and he has some things he can tell you. How are we doing tonight? Good. So like Corky said, my name is Jordan Berquist. I am the Human Resource Director. I took over in June this year. Prior to this, I was a People Operations Lead for Walmart down in Minneapolis. I manage the uh, Human Resource Operations for 18 stores and 5,000 employees down there. Uh, I lived in the area from 2013 to 2019, uh, including attending the university here for a year back in 2013. So. Just wanted to come in, introduce myself, get uh, get a face to the name. Uh, I look forward to working with each and every one of you, uh, making this place a premier employment destination, not just for the city here, but the state as a whole. I uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, then we've got uh, Mar Marty Sievert, Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities presentation. He's joining by Zoom. Great, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council and administration, uh, my name is Marty Seifert. I work with Flaherty and Hood as uh, a member of the government relations community uh, advocating for rural cities. The Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities is uh, made up of 106 rural cities. Crookston has been a longtime member and supporter. We appreciate that. And uh, each year I give a little update on what happened at the legislative session. And this will be a very brief presentation tonight because frankly, the legislature didn't do a whole lot last year as much as they had uh, four and a half months to, to get some things done. Uh, so I'm just gonna uh, speak a little bit about uh, the items that were under consideration and what we advocated for. So our board of directors, which is made up of mayors, members of the city councils and administrators, set up an agenda that uh, uh, direct us to try to advocate for at the state capitol on behalf of coalition members and coalition members as a whole. So the top priority this last year and has been a high priority other years is local government aid. As many of you know, local government aid is a large chunk of many of the rural cities budgets. It could be down in the 10, 20, 30% range. It could go all the way up to 60%. If we don't have local government aid, it ends up uh, resulting in property tax increases or reduced services or both. Uh, our goal this year was to uh, update the formula and add $90 million of appropriation increases. Um, the governor did not advocate for any formula change or any new money this year. Uh, the House proposed $34 million of increases with a formula change. The Senate uh, did not have an increase, nor did they have a formula change. But when the House and Senate met in conference committee, they compromised at a $30 million increase with no change in the formula. Um, they put a hold harmless uh, provision in there so nobody goes backwards like East Grand Forks is kind of in that predicament. It was incorporated in the tax bill. The tax bill was sent to the House floor. The House has to pass it first. The speaker never brought the bill up, so the bill never passed. So there's no LGA increase for the coming year under this new money. Next couple items, um, the Public Facilities Authority, uh, or PFA, helps fund sewer and water plants, uh, water towers, and uh, uh, water treatment plants for drinking water. Uh, largely a rural program, it's funded in the bonding bill, 
The governor, we proposed uh, $299 million in bonding for these programs. The governor proposed $200 million. The House and Senate never publicly released their programs, although they said they would be at or above the governor's level. Uh, the bill was never brought to the floor out of conference committee, so there was no bonding bill and therefore no new money for these uh, sewer and water projects. Uh, there was another proposal for lead line mapping and replacement grants. Uh, some of you maybe heard in the news about um, old lead pipes in places like Mississippi and Flint, Michigan, essentially poisoning the uh, water supply for, for the residents of those cities. And so um, what this provision was is to try to identify where old, uh, outdated, potentially hazardous lead pipes were so we can start getting our arms around uh, their replacement. There was a proposal from the governor to do 4 million. We advocated for 30 million. The house had um, 5 million for lead line replacements and 4 million a year for two years to do inventory and mapping. The Senate had no money. There was no conference committee report released from the human services uh, committee. Uh, there was no human services bill. And so therefore that initiative did not pass. The next couple items were child care facility grants and business and training for child care. Um, one was in the jobs bill, one was in the bonding bill. The jobs bill never made it to the floor for a vote. It was never, the bonding bill didn't pass either. The next item, we actually have some good news and that was broadband. Um, we advocated for $100 million of broadband, uh, particularly aimed at the rural areas. The governor proposed $170 million, the House $25 million, the Senate $110 million. The conference report came out at $210 million, which is more than anybody proposed. And the reason it came up so high is that the federal government showered a lot of money down on the state of Minnesota and other states for broadband. So the final outcome was 210 million. That was 50 million of state matched money with 160 federal aid. And uh, that was passed as part of the agriculture bill this year and was signed into law. It's been a little cumbersome and slow trying to get the, the deployed revenues uh, out to the uh, areas because we've had some issues with some of the people that are uh, doing broadband contracting. And so we wanna make sure the money is spent well uh, but that is a, a very large amount of money for broadband. BDPI, we proposed 20 million, the governor had seven, the House and Senate had no bonding bill, no bonding bill passed, therefore no money for BDPI. And I know that's been used up in your, uh, in your neck of the woods for uh, uh, any type of job enhancement, uh, creating new jobs or bringing new businesses in. This is to pay for public infrastructure like um, access roads or sewer pipes or uh, water pipes. Uh, housing, there were three initiatives. Uh, none of those uh, uh, passed because they would have been in the bonding bill or the jobs bill and neither of those bills passed. And then finally, the last item I have is transportation, large city street funding um, for cities over 5,000 people. We propose 25 million a year. Uh, the governor had uh, no increase in base funding, but some money had matched up for federal funds. The House had no increase in base funding, but 9.7 to match up federal funds. And then the Senate had 11.4 <coughs> in dedicated base funding and various amounts for federal matching money, but no conference report was released and no transportation bill was passed. Uh, corridors of Commerce, finally, we propose 200 million a year to try to keep our major thoroughfares across rural Minnesota updated uh, and in good shape. Um, the governor had some proposed project selection changes, but really didn't change uh, the regional balance at all. Um, the Senate really was a champion for us, $152 million increase, uh, but there was no conference report and therefore no transportation bill. So, of all the items I went through the last five minutes, the only one that actually passed was broadband. Um, there's just a big dysfunction between uh, the legislature and the governor this last year. So the, uh, the budget surplus that we had, which was a little over 9 billion, uh, they refilled the UI trust fund. Uh, that's all these businesses that laid off employees. These employees obviously had to get some type of compensation. And so the UI trust fund was replenished to the tune of $2 billion. And so the budget surplus went from um, 
uh, a little over nine billion to a little over seven billion, but now the money has been piling up even more and more. Some people are asking why that's the case. Is it great management by the state? The short answer is on the revenue side, I think all of you know we're experiencing a lot of inflation right now. So if you go buy some toothpaste, it might have been $3 last year and now it's $4 this year. I think all of you know basic math. So if you take the basic sales tax rate of 6.875% and you multiply it times $3 last year uh, and $4 this year, you're collecting that much more tax without the state really doing anything other than taking advantage of the fact that people are paying more money for more things and therefore collecting more taxes because your sales tax is a percentage. And so as people struggle to pay for certain uh, goods uh, at your local hardware store or Walmart or whatever it is that you happen to have, they are paying uh, more sales tax uh, into the treasury because those items are more expensive. So they're kind of getting a double whammy on Main Street. Uh, income taxes also have been growing as well. So that's kind of a short explanation of that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you for your time. I'll stand for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Questions? Uh, Marty, I was wondering if there's been any conversation about cannabis and about the legislation around that, knowing that um, that's kind of been thrown at the local level to make some decisions. And I know that was kind of a, a rushed um, legislation <laughs> Piece. And I know it's something that we as well as other cities are dealing with and trying to our best to regulate that at the local level. I was curious if that's going to be part of the conversation in this next year. Yeah, good question. Um, I have been at now two city councils where I physically came to do my presentation and um, the city's put a, a temporary moratorium uh, on the ability to sell cannabis, which they have, you have the right to do that. And there's some model ordinances that the League of Cities has for you to look at. Um, that a lot of cities are passing just to give them some breathing room to examine what's going on. And then I do believe, to answer your question, I do believe that the legislature will um, deal with this issue. It kind of passed, I don't want to say accidentally, but the House put it in the Human Services Bill. The Senate thought it was something different than what it was. So they essentially legalize edible cannabis uh, materials without really understanding, I think, the full uh, impact of it. Um, not the smokable kind, but the you know gummies and whatever uh, candy version or edible versions, brownies or whatever it is. Um, therefore, I think they're going to try to set up a, a structure around taxation. Originally, they interpreted this under the food statute, which was tax exempt. Um, and then I think there was a reinterpretation of it that it would be taxed at a basic rate because it's really not considered, I mean, I don't consider it nutritional food, uh, but there was a back and forth with the revenue department on that. So they do have to revisit this issue. Uh, we would welcome any discussion that you want to bring forward on the challenges of this. I know that you obviously have a U of M campus in town. Uh, where I'm sitting now in Marshall, Minnesota, where I live, we have a, a state university, Southwest Minnesota State. We did put a, a temporary moratorium on it last summer. Um, we haven't had a lot of complaints from the college kids. Uh, they vote with their feet, I suppose, and go get it somewhere else. But it's, you know, it is on the sale of it, not necessarily the possession of it. So uh, they will have a discussion on it and we'll uh, certainly um, be observing and translate back to you what we find out. With their uh, issue of daycare being such a huge thing for the state of Minnesota, what's their reasoning or what's their future plans to work on that uh, to help cities out with some sort of plan with that uh, that didn't pass neither the House or the Senate? Right. You know, that has, has had traditionally bipartisan support. Um, there's two issues here. One is regulation and over-regulation of, of childcare facilities and in-home daycares, which are a key piece of this everybody forgets about. When a, a, a middle-aged woman who has an in-home daycare, maybe takes care of half a dozen kids, decides she's tired of filling out paperwork and dealing with bureaucrats and just shutters her doors and goes, work, goes and works at DigiKey or somewhere else, that's six lost slots that you're probably never getting back again. And that's been happening all over the state year after year after year. They're 
fewer child care slots available in Minnesota right now than there have been for many years. Uh, conversely, there has to be a discussion of money uh, and being able to make this worthwhile, having kids in your home or putting a child care center together. So we are con trying to convince the legislature you aren't going to deregulate your way out of this and you aren't going to fund your way out of this. It's got to be both. You have got to put common sense um, regulation reform in place like our neighboring states that don't have uh, kids dying and so forth. You know, let's have a common sense set of regulations and guidelines that other states have. I think part of it is just the bureaucracy and being friendly with it. I'll give you one example we had from a city uh, uh, down south. Um, a daycare provider happened to be in the audience and she said that uh, the Department of Human Services that requires her to take training has done the same training year after year after year. You know, there's nothing you have to be there physically for, you just have to watch a presentation. So she has to shut down her daycare and drive three and a half hours away to go to a half a day presentation that easily could be done on Zoom, uh, but for whatever reason, they don't do it that way. So she said, it's, it's just one more thing that they need to move into the 21st century on as well as filling out paperwork and all the nonsense that goes with it. And then conversely, of course, we have to deal with funding. Funding is a couple different things. There's a capital funding of uh, buildings, bricks and mortar, and then there's the general, um, can you match up some money so families aren't priced out of this and the provider can actually make a little bit of money to make it worth their while? Because this is a precious commodity. This is our kids we're talking about. Um, so we have a couple initiatives on both of those. Uh, the matching grant program is popular. Um, I would encourage you to look at Wilmer as one example of where they brought the public and private sector together to come up with a functional, affordable daycare system for their business community and the young families of their area. They partnered with Candy Oye County. Um, but there has to be some money involved in this. And on the child care grant program, that's a bonding issue and uh, the bonding bill has to pass. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's an important piece of, of any legislation is getting that bonding bill through uh, with a child care matching grant program. So on that note, <clears throat> you know, we have a child care center that we've been trying to push through for the last year. And some of the biggest issues is just waiting on the licensure piece. And I wonder if that's part of the conversation as well, because it seems like you know, even with us talking to, you know, Mark and Deb about trying to get it pushed through that all these pieces have taken so long. I don't understand how businesses can succeed if this is the process that takes just to open up something. So is that part of the conversation? Is that a known um, like understanding that people are having these issues, especially in rural areas, and just getting the basic licensure? Yeah, it's been a discussion on this and I mean, our ethanol plants are, uh, you know, other business licenses, the state government is bigger than it has ever been in history. And so a lot of the legislators, I think, need to step up when when it comes time for the state agencies to get their budgets and say, you have more FTEs and more employees walking around than you have ever had before. What is going on? Why is it taking so long? Why do we have ethanol plants waiting 18 months for a permit? Why do we have daycare centers waiting uh, months, if not years, to get their permits? What are you people doing all day from nine to five? Uh, that, that's a conversation that has to take place when you have a chance to talk to your legislators locally. Uh, Senator Johnson, I believe, is unopposed. So uh, unless 18,000 people write somebody else in, I have a feeling he's probably going to be coming back to the state Senate. Um, those are conversations between now and January 2nd. <laughs> Uh, that I would encourage you to have with them on, on holding some accountability for the administration, because frankly, uh, it's not the legislature that, that gives these permits out, it's the, the administration. So we have to push heavily on them uh, to, to become more efficient and to, to streamline this process and get these things done. In many cases, we have blueprints ready to go uh, we have uh, the funding ready to go, the banks and, and the partners and local government ready to go. It's the state government that's clumsy, slow, uh, not responsive. Yeah. Thank you. 
Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you for your time, Marty. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. This brings us to the agenda. Does anyone wish to add or remove anything from tonight's agenda? I have a motion to approve tonight's agenda. So move. Thank you, Don. Is there a second? Second, Your Honor. Second by Clayton. Discussion? Hearing none, can I have roll call, please? Jerdy? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Briggs? Aye. Cavalier? Aye. Russell? Aye. Platt? Aye. Bedbratton? Aye. Melby? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, this brings us to the consent agenda. Does anyone wish to remove anything from the consent agenda? Can I have a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda? So moved. Thank you, Steve. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Delane. Can I have a roll call, please? Jerdy? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Briggs? Aye. Cavalier? Aye. Kressel? Aye. Platt? Aye. Bedbratton? Aye. Melby? All right. Okay, motion carries. Uh, no public hearings. Regular agenda, Ashley. Yes, Your Honor. Item 8.01 is a resolution to approve entering into a contract for the public um, library building repairs. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve this resolution? I'm okay, Your Honor. Thank so you. I'll second it, Your Honor. Uh, Dwayne and Clayton. Thank you. Discussion? Or get a little brief on this? <laughs> yes, please. this is. Uh, a resolution for basically three repairs to the public library. As you may or may not know, for a number of years there's been a problem with water. <coughs> so we engaged uh, WIDSETH to do an analysis. They indicated that part of the water problem is from the highest windows on the uh, building. They believe that the windows may be leaking and the sealants may be leaking. So um, there is a uh, $138,000 cost to repair <coughs> that, as well as address the slope issue on the roof. In addition, we find that some of our heat loss and cooling difficulties uh, may be related to the windows. Uh, the windows, as we understand it, are those which were put in on the original construction. Uh, so they are not triple pane, they are not with all of the innovations that have occurred since that time, and I believe that was about 1978, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and we have a part of this a resolution, the cost of that. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, as we were preparing this resolution, uh, the lights in the parking lot went out <laughs> and are dysfunctional. So the times that we are open when it's dark, we have no lights in the parking lot. This is not only a safety no. issue, but it's just a common courtesy issue to have people be able to see where they're going. So the resolution uh, asks for this amount of money, those three separate projects, I believe they total uh, approximately $217,000. Uh, we do have money. Uh, the uh, library has some funding which has been designated for improvements, but we also have land and building uh, monies sufficient to uh, accomplish these tasks. But how much funds do they have in their building? $15,000. $15, <laughs> yeah. But they used, they did have 31, but they uh, spent 16 of it engaging in the study to get us where we are today. So when, when the bids were done, was it, be, was it discussed at all to remove those windows and just... Yeah, it was. Roof, yes, roof. yes, it was discussed. It, it, was it a cost savings or was it added to the cost? Uh, the window replacement, I don't believe, would, as I recall, it didn't add or subtract to the cost. We still had to either do it over or leave the window component. So I just wonder if we're not looking at some similar issues down the road, if we don't get rid of the windows and just roof, roof over it. According to the study that we have, no, we're not. Okay. Um, that, that certainly was discussed, just eliminating the windows but it, it didn't appear from what we received in our report that that would be a significant factor. Well, I kind of agree with Delane. Uh, you know, that, that seems like them windows up there have been causing a problem for many <coughs> years, and it's just going to happen again. 
I guess we uh, have a representative here from Widseth. Would you like yeah. to fill us in, please? Uh, Brent Dahman, project architect with Widseth. Um, with regard to the cause of the leakage, um, we perceive it as the sealant, the joint sealants around the openings in relation to a flashing, the flashing at the base. Um, a lot of that is just regular routine maintenance um, that just comes with joint sealants, whether it's a window, door opening, you know, it's something that comes with the, the product that you have to deal with. Um, as far as roofing over the top or, you know, creating a peak, um, we did take a look at that. Um, as compared to um, what is recommended for approval now, um, we don't believe there'd be really any additional cost savings, at least at today's numbers, to construct a roof over the top. It certainly is an option, but I, I won't see it as a cost savings from what we're looking at today. Probably not a cost savings today, but potential cost savings down the road if the windows aren't routinely um, it's a maintenance item. Yeah, yep. maintained, and then we're in the same situation 15 years from now. Potentially, with, with the joint sealants, it's something that with time has to be maintained, um, replaced from time to time. Um, the windows themselves that are up there now, you know, they're, you know, 30 years old, so they've certainly served their lifespan um, so there definitely is a benefit there to, to replacing them at this point. What is the suggested maintenance time frame for how often to reseal those or what happens? Um, from a maintenance standpoint, we would always recommend annually just observing them just to make sure if they've deteriorated, if there's been any cracking, pull, pulling away and then touching it up. Um, as far as replacing it, um, you're probably looking every five, six years, you know, as far as a maintenance. But again, it's sort of a yearly the monitoring. The seal, not the, the seal. windows. Yeah, the window, <clears throat> not the windows. Sure. The windows, you're 25, 30 years. So, Chris, maybe you can answer this question. Aesthetically, inside, would it be, how would it affect the inside not having those windows? I went there, what, four weeks ago, and uh, had her shut the lights off, and just going by the sunlight coming into that window made a heck of a lot of difference. Because if they take them windows <coughs> down there, it's going to be very dark, and like she said. The ceiling is very dark. So when the window specialist came in to give us Excuse me, Chris, could I invite you to the podium, please? Yes. Thank you. We, we did talk to the, uh, to the gentleman that gave us the, 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 light, uh, the, the window bid as well, uh, Dave Anderson. Um, he said that um, because of the um, ceiling being so dark, being that it's all wood, um, that is most likely why, from a design standpoint, that they went with the two banks of lights that they did to begin with, because it's so dark. Um, he said you'd have to put a considerable amount of light in there additionally to make up for the loss of light if you okay. take out the windows. Do we know if like these have been like maintained as they should have been? Nobody's ever been up there until... See, and that's, and that's my concern because I, I don't think we're, we're going to come up with a plan to automatically start looking at maintenance of windows every year. We got bigger things to worry about than checking the caulking around windows each year. So I, I, I just don't see that's ever gonna happen. Well, I think that we should be doing some basic main maintenance in a lot of our buildings. And I think that the longevity of those purchases or things that we've done will last us a lot longer if we're putting that time and energy in the front. Well, so I do can wonder- schedule maintenance. <clears throat> that's yeah. something that we can schedule uh, within the city, either through the library or other departments here. And I think the question you raise or the concern could be addressed that way. Yeah. Well, with all due respect to the council, I've been in this job now for 10 years. And prior to my coming, we did, there was no schedule of any kind on that building. Now, in part and in fairness, that could also be because we were, you know, not as far in 
in terms of our years. We're, we're, we're very quickly approaching 40 years. This building opened in the fall of 84. So this is the fall of 22, so that puts us at 38 years. Everything that we're talking about tonight, um, the windows, um, the exterior lighting, um, not just the windows on the peak that are leaking, but the entire, the windows for the building itself, as well as exterior lighting are all original. And so we will need, regardless of what we do, however you wanna go with this, we still need to have regular maintenance uh, of these buildings, at least the library I can only speak for, but we need to have some kind of a short-term and long-term maintenance plan um, so that we aren't looking at this problem coming up, uh, not just with what we're talking about tonight, but with regard to any other aspect of the building down the road, or we're just gonna end up having to replace it all again at the same time. Right. My question is on those windows now, are, are the windows shot or is it just the caulking? So are these windows mm -hmm. made their 30 year life, which I don't think is out of hand. I mean, it's, people replace windows all the time after 20, 30 years. But is it the window that's bad or just because the caulking was bad? No, those windows, they're actually a translucent panel, so it's like a fiberglass panel. So it is showing signs of its age and, um, and just some of the wear and tear on it. Um, the lower windows, um, again, it's the age, so it's they don't have the same um, R value or U value. Um, but then also they were all originally provided with um, blinds within. Some of them don't work. Um, that's usually a, a challenge when those type of window systems are installed is eventually they're gonna stop working and you got a 50-50 chance whether they stop working open or close. So um, I, I would still recommend replacing them. With a window for 30 years or whatever, I mean, that's the average life of a window. I don't know that maintenance is gonna fix the problem. I mean, it's a reality thing. It's like I replaced my house windows before because they were wore out. And mm -hmm. up there, I imagine it's the sun 24 seven up there and they're gonna get baked and dried out and it's reality. So, I mean, I the maintenance thing could have helped maybe save it the down the road, but eventually they're gonna have to be replaced period. I think. Correct, yeah, with the windows, yeah, it's just the life of it. <coughs> the caulking and the maintenance is more of just yeah. I do want to indicate that we did get two bids <coughs> on the overall plan. We got two bids from local contractors on the windows and two bids on the lighting. Yeah. And uh, what you see in front of you are the lowest responsible bidders. Okay. They were the lowest. Um, some were significantly higher, I might say. Um, so we did present for you tonight the lowest of those. Further discussion. <laughs> how how long is it going to take us to get that lighting repaired or something in the main in the meantime, just for a safety aspect for staff and library goers? I did talk with uh, Valley Electric, um, who gave us the the bid that we um, have um, before you. I think, um, and Josh indicated that it would um, to some extent. I mean, we've had the water issues. There's no question. We've had the water issues at the entrance. Um, and with that concrete and things of that nature. Um, originally, they tied together um, the, all the lighting um, from the Ash Street side as well as the parking lot side, it all went underneath that. So we did have a little bit of electrical work done a few years back, um, and they've talked about coming initially in, in, until the lighting comes. They would uh, come and do something to give us lighting. Um, and they said they could work even if it, the ground froze, if they had to come in with uh, a blowtorch to uh, thaw out wiring and things of that nature. But they're hopeful because we don't know how long it's going to take to get the lighting. Sure. Uh, if, we, if it's approved, uh, we'll get on that and get it ordered immediately. And then we'll just work with them to give ourselves something. I have had a couple of customers come up and say um, that they're very fearful of being, as well as staff, being uh, going out at night. Uh, not just from a from a safety standpoint, from you know, just potential Staying crime, yeah. you know, but also falling, yeah. uh, because they can't see where they're walking. And this one one in particular happened to be an elderly woman, mm -hmm. who comes frequently after dark. So, 
Bert, you have another question. Do we uh, get any kind of warranty or issue or, you know, when we get these contractors, I've never heard of the Schmitz builder, I'm not saying they're bad or good, but at the end of the day, you know, if their work is that somewhat warrantied? Uh, well, they'll be, they're licensed and bonded and they have that uh, assurance for us, mm -hmm. yes. I mean, um, it's a unique <coughs> building, I know this is probably why the bids are so high, but it is a unique setup, but I just want to make sure we got some kind of Yes, contract. they're Schmidt. licensed, they're bonded, and Brent, if you have you, anything else, yeah, you've you worked would with them get, in the past. You would also, yeah, I've worked with them in the past. You would also get sort of the typical one-year warranty plus then any of the product warranties that would come with that. So, Is Schmidt out of... Uh, Schmidt Miller. Schmidt's out of Red Lake Falls. Yeah. Yes, and we did have another bid from, I believe, a contractor in St. Cloud area. Yeah, Bradbury, um, Stam, all of yeah. St. Cloud. Schmidt builders are very good. Mm -hmm. I've, years ago, I've done work side by side with them, and they're professionals all the way through. So, and they would be on the uh, <coughs> roofing and the upper level window, and also the windows throughout the building, so they could coordinate that as well. Further discussion. Is that a winter project you're going to start to attempt, or the wait until spring? Or? No, I, it's going to end up being a spring just spring. because of going through their process and then lead times. It'll be a spring. Windows. For the windows. Uh, windows, I was uh, did speak with um, um, the, the contractor, the window contractor, and they would be able to do window work this winter on the main level, not the peak. And lighting as soon as possible. We don't have a choice. We have to do something with the lighting. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, just, just a safety yeah, issue. It's as soon as they can. Yeah. Either some uh, lighting that's temporary. Temporary or, or something. However, as soon as we can. Yep. Okay. What, do we, what do we got left from big projects there? The boiler. Uh, no, nope, the boiler was was replaced before I started, and I began in um, thirteen as the director. So it's been almost ten years now. Um, actually, maybe it was twelve. No, it was thirteen. So that was maybe, it was it that 10 to 15 year window that the boiler has been replaced. Um, and then the HVAC is original. So that's our next big mm -hmm. chunk of And I got just a, a, nothing in writing, but I did talk with one local contractor about the HVAC. Um, and he's- that on capital improvement for next year or no? Um, I don't know where we have it at, depending on where these shake out. I don't yeah, know I where. Don't know. On capital improvement, yeah. I don't believe so. I don't, think so either. I don't think it was. I think it was windows first, and then for sure lighting. But that's coming real soon, is what you're saying. Well, it's original, right. you know. And, and I original. did speak. I did speak with uh, for one Ryan St. Mitchell. Ryan indicated that he could continue to maintain, or you know, we could continue to fix and keep this unit, these units going. Um, but we've had condensers, different things, you know, that have gone out and been replaced, but. Um, he could use, he could spare the, the air handler. We did talk about that down the road when we do have a need for new HVAC. We could uh, use the existing air handler. He didn't feel that that would have to be replaced going forward. Uh, so he said, um, you know, don't quote me, he said, but we're looking in that neighborhood of 65, he thought, for a new HVAC for the building. Parky, as part of your <coughs> the study of all the city buildings, was the library included in that? Yes, it was. Okay. Anything else? Ashley, can I have a roll call, please? Judy? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Briggs? Aye. Cavalier? Aye. Kressel? Aye. Platt? Aye. Bedrotten? Aye. Melby? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Item eight Thank you. Item 8.02 is a resolution <coughs> accepting a gift of real property and dedicating real property permanently as the public park. Thank you. I have a motion to approve this resolution. I'll make that motion, Your Honor. Thank you, Don. Is there a second? I'll second, Your Honor. A second by Christy. Thank you. Discussion. Before we get a little brief on this, please. Sure. Um, <coughs> as you're aware, we have one uh, publicly dedicated park in Nature's View Development. Uh, and this is the second. Um, I can indicate that this is Nature's View Estates uh, Flat 5. <coughs> the Park Board has been consultant, consulted. They have worked with 
uh, Bob Herkinoff on it. They've examined the property. They've made estimates about our upkeep. Uh, Mr. Herkinoff has provided um, some signage and additional items uh, so that the transition would be very minimal cost uh, to us. There was an original agreement that sometime within 20 years, uh, this, uh, these two parks would be accepted by the city. The city has accepted one. Uh, this is uh, a resolution in front of you to accept the second park. We've also um, discussed, uh, Mr. Herkinoff and our public works uh, director have also discussed the possibility of the two ponds that are on there uh, potentially aiding us in holding uh, high water and yeah, potentially being involved with the um, Pirate 60 acre development uh, and uh, we have an easement that could provide uh, the ability to pipe water out of those to our system here in Crookston. Um, Scott Butt and Jake Solberg of the Park Department have met with Mr. Herkinoff on more than one occasion. The city administration has been out um, and we've I think we've dotted all the I's and crossed the T's, and we're recommending that this uh, resolution be passed. Discussion. Now the second, the second part. Now it doesn't go all uh, the walk path doesn't go all the way around. That, it, that's it? correct. It does not go right. all the way around. Right. Uh, we've looked at the potentiality of building a bridge out to that mass of uh, land. Uh, that's something that could be talked about. But no, they don't go all the way around, but there could be a turnaround and walk ac uh, across. Okay. And there's plenty of access for public to get. Yep, back plenty there of access, for sure. It's also a local fishing hole. Um, stocked or not, apparently has fish because I did have two constituents contact me and said, hey, there's fish in there, we like to fish, among other things, but there's a walking trail. It's very scenic but it also could provide functionality, potentially, for the water situation <coughs> on the pirate acres. Do you, do you stock the fish now, Bob? Thank you for your time uh, tonight, your council, and your honor. And yeah, I stocked it about seven years ago when I dug that first pond. Yeah. Then I dug that other pond, and I stocked that one too. Now it pretty much self-sustains itself. Okay. So uh, I do feed them with these pellets. Yep. And that's kind of a hobby thing of mine. I did it on your park I donated last year. Something I enjoy doing and I'll continue doing as long as I'm around. I told Jake some of the costs and they're very minimal. You know, yep. I know I spend three, 400 bucks a year on pellets or whatever mm -hmm. for both of them, so. But you don't have to keep restocking the fish year after No, year. They re the walleyes don't spawn in there. I stocked them twice now. The original time and about four years later, they're about two bucks a fish. Usually we stock about 500. The perch and the sunfish, they reproduce and they're doing plenty in there. And they get, I'd say if anything, there's quite a few fish in there, but there's a lot of hooking mortality. Kids, you know, and they're, I'm sure a few take some <laughs> their kids, <laughs> but they've been really good. I really have had no problems out there. Right. So That's it's good. worked out pretty well. I think it's a great asset for Crookston. I set it up with uh, native prairie grass. There's really not much more and there's a trail and it's a gravel trail. There's uh, 6,000 feet of trails I put around there. I put fabric underneath it. So that's, you never know down the road they might want to do something. There are grants from uh, Lessard Sam's Act that sometimes will pave them. I paved a lot of state trails, a lot of city trails where they got Lessard Sam's money and that's why I put the fabric underneath. You never know down the road, somebody might say, hey, let's pave it. You know, if we can get money from the state uh, that, it's a sales tax outdoor thing. Uh, I don't know how they go about getting it, but there's quite a bit of money available in that. If it's for an outdoor, uh, you know, project. So that's, so, you know, I can't think of anything left to do out there. It's okay. gonna be a total of about 30 acres. It gets used a lot. There's a lot of walkers out there. Yeah. And a lot of kids out there fishing, adults too. And uh, photographers, you know, so I, I, I tried to set it up as best I could. I really believe it's finished. I went over with Jake a number of times and Scott and uh, 
you know, we went over everything, you know, and I think we're all pretty much on board. It's something I promised to give in 20 years when I started this project <coughs> seven years ago. I thought it was going to take me 20 years to sell all these lots. <laughs> well, suddenly I'm down to about four lots and I'm retiring, but I'd like to donate it now because it times out with me getting out and retiring, you know. So uh, I didn't think it'd go this fast. That's why I put that time frame on there. Well, I think it's a good deal for the city. You've done I good. think it was a good project for both of us. You know, it wasn't no, it was a big risk, but you guys took a lot of risk too. Yeah. We put those cul-de-sacs in, we put in those roads. We did that all about three years ago. Now that would probably be, I don't know, Rich Clausen, is there, would that be 40% more right now? I mean, we got a good investment there. We did it at the right time. I know I went to you guys and I said, let's spend some money. And it wasn't a little amount. We were dropping five, 600,000 a crack on that stuff. And, uh, but boy, what a great investment it ended up being. We got a lot of nice houses out there and those cul-de-sacs. Uh, we did that project on Fisher Avenue last year. I put 20,000 yards of dirt out there, built all them cul-de-sacs up, you know, stripped the black, put the clay in put the grass seed on, it looks pretty nice out there now. That's something I did after the fact. I just wanted it to look nice. I wanted it to work for Crooks and luckily that road project was right there. We couldn't have timed that out better. Yep. So, you know, there's only one thing I wish. Uh, this was about a year ago. I said I was retiring. I told you guys about a year and a half ago. I had 60 acres. I really wanted to sell that to the city. And I, I, and I was dealing with Amy on it. And I think that was set up poorly. I should have been dealing with the council. I couldn't even come to the meetings. It wasn't open, it was a closed meeting. Yeah, it's water under the bridge. It's too bad it's, though. Yeah, it is. We've been down that road. That's not, well, I just wanted, it's not you know, bring it, it's it, not I bring it up. I can sell that land without not wanting it to up. sell it to you guys. Bob, let's not bring it up. That's, that ship has sailed. Okay, I just didn't want you guys to think I didn't offer it to you first, because I did. I said I want. I sold it for farmland Bob. prices. I just wanted to make that clear. You Bob. guys weren't thinking I sold it without you guys. No, nope, we understand. Land. Okay, that's the only thing in this seven, eight year deal that I think didn't work. Thank Everything you. Everything else was good. Thank you, Bob. Thanks you for everything Thank you you've done out there. Thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you guys. You've been good to work with throughout the years. Yep. It's worked out great. Yep. yep. Any further discussion? <laughs> Roll call, please. Jordy? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Briggs? Aye. Cavalier? Aye. Kressel? Aye. Platt? Aye. Bedratton? Aye. Melby? Aye. Okay, motion carries. <coughs> Moving on. Item 8.03 is a resolution providing grants to nonprofit organizations for the 2023 calendar year, Your Honor. Thank you. So, <clears throat> one thing I want to see if we can. Make a motion oh. for a second. I have a motion to approve this agenda. For this resolution. Or I mean this resolution, sorry. I'll make the motion. Okay, thank you. Second. I'll second that. Wayne. Wayne? <laughs> Don't okay. Thank you. Now you can have discussion. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I, I wonder if we can take a last stab at um, getting Scruffy Tail some funds. I mean, I, 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 I didn't want to vote for $10,000 last Meeting, but I probably would have voted for five. So I want to know if there's any appetite out there for for us maybe going that route for would five thousand dollars. I would agree with that. Well, you said five thousand wouldn't do them any good. I just like I would love us to do the ten grand. I, I mean, would it too. It's so important yeah. to this community, yeah. and it's like we were I was talking to him yesterday about doing a benefit for him or whatever. Try to get. Things. I just I yeah. walked through that building after yeah. the meeting after we had this and I got passed. And we made a mistake there. If you guys have not been out there, they need new new kennels and stuff. It's yeah. it's asinine that we, we support the thing, but we don't. And I and I you know I without them, this town is going to be a zoo with animals. And is, is ten grand going to fix the problem? No. But at the end of the day, these animals are well taken care of. They usually get back to their owners. You know, they're chipped or whatever. You know, and I talked to them about different things about okay, work with the vets and see if you can get that bills cheaper and. Yeah. And find ways and different things, and it's a it's a major major thing the city of Crooks, and I, I think we really missed the boat on that. Yeah. And she said, I mean, I gotta agree, five thousand. If you can't do the whole project, you can't. You know, I I, I get anymore, that, Steve. But, but like I said, we've asked all of our department heads to cut, 
and cut and cut. So I mean, not that they um, can't do it another year. Maybe they come back in a different time and ask for us at a different time. You know, so maybe they bank it for now and try to do it a different, you know, do half now or half later. It's still five thousand dollars. They still could do some stuff. Mr. I think, Mr. Riggs and I agree with what you're saying because of the fact that we do have reserve, enough reserve to support a project like that, and I believe that we should support that, that, that kind of a project because she has really worked hard to <coughs> clean that up, and she needs some money to fix it and get candles and so forth, and that serves the whole region. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, kind of talking or bouncing off what, what uh, Don had to say is that I think we also need to look at this and the reality is is that if we don't have scruffy tails our already very small place force is going to now be having to drive to Red Lake Falls or to East Grand Forks and spending that much more time out of our city so I think we need to look at this as more of how this is providing a service that we need to continue to support and that this isn't just another nonprofit organization that's asking for money they're actually providing a service and if we're trying to keep and support that being in this town this is a much larger issue than whether or not we can you know they can work on something for another six months or what have you i think we really need to look at it from that perspective because that's really what it's coming down to it's not about somebody asking for additional funds for their nonprofit, right this is a service we're utilizing um, and I was a little skeptical at first, but you know, the more I thought about this as well, the more I was like, okay, this isn't just another nonprofit asking for money for the city. Like this is a service that we're utilizing, and if we don't have it anymore, then that also affects us in other ways. Yes, Wayne. When they presented, they also talked to us about their new business plan and what they've done, and if I'm not mistaken, I mean, our costs have gone up how much for what they used to charge us to take in animals. They increased their fees to us, right, at the city? What they, what they have done, Councilman, is we <clears throat> used to pay $250 a month for the kennel reserve. We now pay $350. In addition, we used to pay $4 uh, per animal kennel. We now pay 18 but we charge 20 Okay, I'm not saying what we charge, I'm just saying what they're charging us. So they are looking at their business plan, they're trying to increase their profits, and we are using their service, but we are most definitely paying for it. Um, we didn't hand over money for a dog park. We made them go out and, and raise their funds for a dog park, uh, those folks. I, I don't feel good about taxing people and then turning around and making a donation off your excess of what you've overtaxed. I don't feel that's right. Because I, I don't have pets. I don't do this blah, blah, blah. I don't care. I don't like dogs running in my yard. I like it that they put them or whatever they do, they process them. But the whole thing is, is that we're using their service. We're paying for their service. Now, if you turn around and donate that to it, you're going to have people coming from every nonprofit to ask for donations. And I personally, I'm going to say one more time, I don't feel right about donating monies that have been collected as taxes to a nonprofit, period. You had a motion for an additional $5,000. No, no, I haven't made a, no, no, I haven't no. made a motion. No. I just no. want to discuss it. Yes. There's no motion. Um, the grants provided. On the grants provided. Correct. So you're but, delaying your thinking. If you, if you do 5000 now that to push them a little harder to fundraise yep. and try to cover I mean, I, like fires. I said last meeting, I, I probably would have supported five. I, I would have supported $5,000, but I was not going to support 10, and that's why you voted no on it. So I guess if 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 that's what it takes, I'll make a motion right now. I'll second it. You've already got a motion. You've already got a motion. Oh. I'll second. So let's take care of this motion. Okay. <coughs> right? Yep. It's got a motion in front of you. It can be amended, refused, that kind of thing. But it's easier to do this because we've kind of already all agreed on this part of it. 
And if you want to do something separate, I guess. Well, we're done. Okay, that, can, can, that can be done, certainly. Uh -huh. We can do that right after this motion then? Yeah. Okay. I just got a question on this too. You know, for years, right, like with the Golden Link, we've put X amount of dollars into it because they're our senior citizens. Mm -hmm. yeah. How come now it's a grant? Why isn't that under Park and Rec in their budget? This is a grant because the city, as a taxing entity, can cannot legally just give money. These are grants. Okay. The city can grant money. Okay. Call it semantical or not, but grants can be given by a city based on criteria. And as you see in the resolution, it is articulated what public benefit is there. Right. But I mean, it's been the same benefit for years, and we've given it every year. But it was which we should have. We should do. Not legally done. Right? Correct. Example: plowing the <coughs> parking lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a grant that the Golden Link or this entity can use for these stated purposes. Mm. So every year they're going to have to come up with something to to do to, to, in order to get this again. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Quite frankly, and if the criteria you established previously are still met, <coughs> that'll be a council decision. Yes. It, it was pretty much, in my mind, it was a program. Yeah. It was through Park and Rec. That's why it came out of their budget. Right. It was no different than, say, some of the kids' things. Absolutely. And, and that's why they said this was... <coughs> We'll do this for the seniors as long as they're doing this for the young folks. It's kind of we, we're give and take. Yep. That that's how that got. Mm -hmm. What he's saying is is that he wants to claim it as a different ball game, as long as you have the same end result and it's <coughs> and it's cleaner or whatever for his purposes. I don't think it's ours. cleaner. I think it's leak. I think legal. the term is legal. <laughs> legal. Let, Let me just clarify. Legal. Let me just clarify. I think the, the it's difference it's not though. for my purposes. Yeah. It's for the city's yeah. purposes yeah. to go. be safe. I think yeah. the difference is that with the park and rec, they're running those programs where the Golden Lake is in, is owned on its own and not a city owned or run, run operation. And that's where the difference is. And, and I would also make, also mention that I understand where you're coming from about, you know, every nonprofit coming to us, but I think that it's not providing the service that is directly affecting our police officers and the service that's being provided for the city. So that's where I would draw a, a clear line in the difference between somebody else coming to us versus us considerably, and understanding too that their books and their bottom line is not looking good and they're losing money. So, I mean, and I think it, I would also say, um, and I don't know if any other council have, have noticed this, but Scruffy Tells has really done like a 180 and their, um, their board and how they're trying to raise money and things is very different than I think we have in the past. And I think we need to consider that as well. But the reality is as everything else is going up with inflation, you know, and these dollars have not been probably reviewed for quite a while. I think we need to keep those things in mind as well. Yeah. Know, that's a key point there is, you know, yeah, they did up it this year, bad yeah. year to up it for us, but at the end of the day, when was the last yeah. time they asked for an increase for yeah. that facility? Yeah. I don't think they ever have. No. But they also stated, you know, that they did get a stronger board now. They've got different policies. They've got different fees. And I would like to see them see what happens with their new policies and new fees. And, and like I said there again, I, I just can't see the donation part of it. Well, I think I would have, I would question this if they continuously come back to us year after year. I think this is for a very specific thing that they're trying to rectify that is something we utilize the most. So, um, and I think that we've all, I wouldn't be in agreement that they do need to yeah. work harder at fundraising. And I don't know how many of us have saw the Facebook post where they were out of food, but within like a day, they had like 800 pounds of food. So I think it doesn't take much to do that kind so of fundraising. So you're saying the community is willing to donate to them? They supported them and in the all the fundraising. So you're on agreed. a committee. We agreed. right now our resolution we're providing grants to a nonprofit organization for the 2023 calendar year for Golden Link, Tri Valley. 
and the down DCDP and ox cart days. This is what is the motion. We have a motion. Thank you. Let's call for the question. Okay, we'll call for the vote, please. Jurdy. Aye. Erickson? Aye. Briggs? Aye. Cavalier? Aye. Kressel? Aye. Clack? Aye. Bed Brunton? Aye. Smelby? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Now. The amendment. Amended on. So now I will make a motion to move forward and donate $5,000 to, oh, to sure. Scruffy Tales. Is that a second? There's a grant. There's a grant. There's a grant. So we got a motion by Delane and a second by Don. So it's, I guess we had enough discussion. Let's call for the vote. Well, I, 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 I kind of feel the same way as Wayne does there. I don't, I don't mind taking money out of the reserves to do this stuff, but if we're going to take it out of the reserves, it should benefit everybody. And this is all, all this, all this whole thing is doing is benefiting the people that have pets that don't want to take care of them. I mean, or is it benefiting no, the police no, department that know. doesn't have to it's drive to East Grand Forks or to Thief River? Your Honor, you, did you want me to call? Yeah. When we vote? talk about the yeah. overall uh, benefit, I think that's where we're. Let's call for the at. vote, please. Jordy? <clears throat> Aye. Erickson? Aye. Briggs? Aye. Cavalier? Aye. Kressel? Aye. Clack? So, a question. I mean, when you call for other discussion, why can't we discuss it? We've discussed through this okay. Okay. whole thing. We've spent even on uh, the first resolution regarding right. grants for nonprofit. We had a heavy discussion on Scruffy Tales. Okay. So I just feel that what's what more is there to be said on this? Let's just right. call for the vote and see where okay. we're at. All right. Bedrun. Nay. Melby. Nay. Motion carries. Okay. Moving on. <clears throat> Item 8.04 is a resolution calling for a public hearing on proposed 2022 street assessment on Project 984, Your Honor. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve this resolution? I make that motion, Your Honor. I'll Thank second you. that, Your Honor. Okay, that by Clayton, Clayton and Don. <coughs> Thank you. Corky, discussion? Yes, these are projects that were, um, by resolution, declaring the cost in the uh, consent agenda. So all of these are exactly the same, and what we're doing is calling for a public hearing so that people who have had their speed projects and other projects can come forward and speak about the assessment. That's, they're all the same. Uh, you've already approved the cost, um, declaring the cost to be assessed and ordering the preparation of the proposed assessment, and then there'll be a public hearing on them so any individuals can come in and speak. The letters go out with this if this is approved, right? Correct. Could, immediately yes. following the approval of this, uh, Correct. people can come back. Yes. <clears throat> so they're, I, they're individualized, but they're all the same. And these are projects that have already been done or are going to be done? Done. Done. Done, done, done. That's what I thought. Yes. Okay, further discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, can I roll call, please? Jordy? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Briggs? Aye. Cavalier? Aye. Kressel? Aye. Clapp? Aye. Ed Bratton? Aye. Smelby? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Item 8.05 is a re resolution calling for a public hearing on proposed 2022 street assessments on Project 985, Your Honor. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve this resolution? So moved. Thank you, Joe. Is there a second? I'll second, Your Honor. Thank you, Christy. Discussion? Hearing none, can I roll call, please? Jordy? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Briggs? Aye. Cavalier? Aye. Kressel? Aye. Platt? Aye. Bed Bratton? Aye. Melby? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Item 8.06 is a resolution calling for a public hearing of proposed 2022 street assessment on Project 986. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve this resolution? Oh, Make okay. that motion. Oh, go ahead, Steve. Steve. And Steve. Steve and Clayton. Thank you. Discussion? Hearing none, can I roll call, please? Jody? <coughs> Aye. Erickson? Aye. Briggs? Aye. Cavalier? Aye. Russell? Aye. Platt? Aye. Bed Bratton? Aye. Melby? Aye. Okay, motion carries. 
Item 8.07 is a resolution calling for a public hearing on proposed 2022 street assessment on Project 987. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve this resolution? So move, Your Honor. Thank you, Don. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. second. Delane, I guess he was louder. <laughs> 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 Discussion? Hearing none, can I have roll call, please? Jerdy? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Briggs? Aye. Cavalier? Aye. Kressel? Aye. Clatt? Aye. Bet Bratton? Aye. Melby? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Item 8.08 .08 is a resolution calling for a public hearing and proposed 2022 street assessment on Project 988. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve this resolution? I'll, I'll make that motion, Honor. Your Honor. I'll take, take Christy and <laughs> I'll second. Delane. Thank you. Discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, can I roll call, please? Jerdy? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Briggs? Aye. Cavalier? Aye. Kressel? Aye. Black? Aye. Beth Bratton? Aye. Melby? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Item 8.09 is a resolution calling for a public hearing on proposed 2022 special assessments for unpaid water and sewer charges for current services, Your Honor. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve this resolution? I'll moved. Thank you, Joe. Is there a second? Second. Second by Don. Thank you. Anything to add to this, Corky? No, I know there are certain items that we've done, uh, mowed lawns, we've done other uh, unpaid water and sewer charges, and we can uh, make them um, liens or tax assessments, and we want a public hearing so people can come in and say either why they didn't pay or why this isn't a good idea. And they're all going in on the same thing now? Yes. Okay. Further discussion? Hearing none, can I roll call, please? Jerdy? Aye. Erickson? Aye. Briggs? Aye. Cavalier? Aye. Russell? Aye. Clatt? Aye. Bed Bratton? Aye. Melby? All right. Okay, a motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Moving on. Corky? Well, it's been, as you can see, a busy two weeks. I've um, had a number of meetings with various individuals uh, for SEH at the airport. We worked many hours with Chris Boyk on the library proposal that you saw. Uh, we've had uh, meetings regarding Cheetah. We've had meetings regarding the multi-purpose uh, complex out at the high school. Uh, met with Scruffy Tails on more than one occasion. And we've had, uh, Ashley and I attended a cannabis uh, legalization webinar. Uh, and I have some ideas now, as you've asked for a resolution to come before you for an ordinance. Uh, and hopefully we'll see that in the next month or two. Uh, and then uh, we went to UMC and discussed sustainability with them. Uh, with Shannon Stassen, we had FEMA uh, phone meetings. Uh, we've also had a meeting with Jason Carlson regarding the child care uh, issue. Uh, and then uh, we hope to have a council working session on Monday, November 7th, from so uh, 5 to 7 p.m. The agenda to be established will be uh, the pie, I call it the pilot 60 acres and what we could look forward to in the development there. Obviously, we have to deal with the water issue and then child care. And we'll have Jason Carlson here, Maureen Hams here from Tri Valley. Uh, we'll have uh, Carrie here, and she may have an additional person to talk to us about child care. Uh, it's time that we have these uh, working sessions or sessions to get these um, moving uh, with you present council members for your ideas and to set the tone for uh, next year. So that will be on uh, Monday, November 7th. It's an off Monday, five to seven. We'll be limited <coughs> to one hour on housing, one hour on childcare. Cause I got a big bet with Tina that we can do that. <laughs> You're gonna lose. <laughs> yeah, she went over, she said over, I went under. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's start with Jake tonight. Nothing, Your Honor. Thank you. Greg ain't here. No. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Brandon. Five to six. Hang to add.
They were here in the last couple of weeks. They got that air exchange system mostly installed in lift station four. So it's been a long time coming, but it's almost done. Um, we had issues with our transmission line coming to town for <coughs> potable water uh, last week. So that stirred up a bunch of iron in the main and <clears throat> caused some discolored water in town. I, the water leaving the plant has been, uh, has had absolutely no iron for two days now. So it <coughs> should be past us here. Um, cleanup week this week. Uh, the guys made it through the Monday's route completely today. So they're making good progress. Um, I'll be sending out tree removal letters for the Samson's edition uh, probably later this week for dead or diseased trees. We inspected that whole edition. There's about 15 city trees that'll be removed and about 25 private trees that'll get letters to be removed. Um, there, Lyle Wilkins is going to be hydro seeding the high water grass damaged areas and he was said he was going to start on the fire hall this week and move on from there and Crookston Concrete has repaired the sidewalks that were damaged <coughs> during the high water event so we're getting towards the end of those repairs here so that's all I got. Brandon on sidewalk repair on South Main now does Crookston Concrete or does Lyle fill in between the sidewalk and the street? That That's Lyle. Lyle took that out. Okay. So he'll put that dirt back in. I, that was the first thing he was going to work on this week, he told me. so. Okay, thank you. Yep. Day one out of your, with the cleanup, any issues have been better? I didn't hear any issues. Um, it went well, you know, that it seemed like the piles were uh, more organized than normal with um, the shorter time frame of being able to put it out. You know, today was a pretty prime example of why we don't want it out right. early. The garbage was blown everywhere. Right. So um, we'll probably have a little bit to clean up here or there after this, but um, I, I Dave said it went well. So, sure. um, and for anybody that uh, hasn't heard yet, the leaves and branches will be picked up next week if they're left because uh, we're down to one garbage truck, so we'll do a complete pass next week on your garbage day to clean up your yard waste. Thank you. On a dike, on a dike by the fire department, did they let you build that up any, or did you have to cut it back down to normal size again? You have to put it back to its original. Yeah, you, yep. To, to qualify for FEMA reimbursement, it has to go back to what it was originally at, so. Okay. Hope they got money to do it again. That's what we're trying for. Yeah. But. Chad, anything tonight? No report tonight, Your Honor. Thank you. Ryan? Not much tonight, but um, as Corky said, our meetings with SCH, and they were the company that um, helped us with our corridor study. Um, we've received the last invoice from them, so I'll be filing for that so that we get the rest of our monies from them. Also filed for our reels grant for the airport for those runway lights, so we should be getting those funds in also. Finished up most of everything for our audit with our insurance carrier, um, Bonnie. Kathy and I met with her on Tuesday. Um, and then it's just cleaning up of the stuff, getting ready for the rest of the year-end stuff. Thanks, Ryan. Tim. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just a couple things. Um, on, we do have a meeting with uh, FEMA tomorrow morning. Uh, we're still discussing uh, getting reimbursed for some of our work, so the department heads have been really working hard and uh, getting all that set up. Um, I know there's still people wondering about uh, money for the private property, getting money reimbursed. That has not been released yet. Um, we'll keep you posted as that comes out. And um, uh, there is, they did release um, some grant monies where we can look for money for doing some of these mitigation projects that you talked about, Tom. So we'll be um, looking into that as soon as we can. And hopefully we can 
grab a hold of some of that money to get some of these problems taken care of for us. Um, we did have an open house last, uh, a couple Saturdays ago, and uh, was really very well attended down at the fire station. Had a lot of people in there, a lot of people from out of town even. <coughs> and uh, they were very surprised that uh, how nice and organized our open house was, and uh, they were hoping that some of their area departments would do it, but uh, that's, that's all on them. Guy's been busy servicing trucks and small engines. It's that time of year, service testing everything, making sure everything's good, um, making sure all of our fire equipment is up to um, snuff. You know, we take a lot of pride in our fire department, so everything is getting a good once over right now. Uh, Greg is gone this week, so the fire department and myself are covering for him. So if any issues or anything come up, just uh, make sure you call down to the fire station, we'll assist you with that. Um, also, we're in the process of looking for my successor. I've been working with Jordan on that. He's been a great help. Um, we'll be, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be working on that. And uh, he's doing an outstanding job at uh, running the show for that. So, thank you. Thanks, Tim. Darren, anything tonight? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a couple uh, updates or highlights real quick. Uh, prior to the council meeting tonight, I attended a city council meeting. Uh, sorry, uh, school board. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, yeah, but, you know, I enjoy it so much. No, uh, school board meeting, uh, one of the agenda items was the annual review of their crisis management policy. Uh, officer Rascott, our school resource officer, and I presented on how uh, we have prepared um, critical incident uh, training plans and uh, um, packets uh, in, in any tr uh, critical in incident event, such as a train derail derailment or other man-made critical incidents. Uh, but more specifically, uh, we work with the school district and train each district staff member, um, which is comprised of classroom and scenario-based training uh, in the ALICE model, which is the uh, alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate in the event of an active intruder. Uh, Officer Ascot, he's put in countless hours on preparing all the schools, both public and private, and the best practices on how to respond to critical incidents. Again, not just specifically active intruder, but other critical incidents. Um, and like we spoke to the, uh, the school board and the council, we just again want to reassure the public and everyone that we extensively train with the school and with our officers on how to prepare and respond to critical incidents, specifically active intruder and that you know, student safety and public safety is and always will be one of my and our top priorities. Um, training, we've been just completing in-house annual mandate and uh, use for force training uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, each officer attended one of two training sessions. Um, Halloween party, uh, so this year again, we're doing a Halloween drive-through or drive-by. I've been working with Linda uh, Morgan, the Crookston High School Leo Club advisor uh, on final preparations. Um, the Halloween party or the drive through sorry, is going to be on Halloween, October 31st from 5 to 7. Uh, the west doors of the Crookston High School. Uh, each trick-or-treater will receive a Halloween bag filled with uh, several safety materials, some small trinkets, and of course candy. Um, so we'll basically show up in a costume in a car and we have Leo Club members and police officers that will be out there to greet you and hand you a bag. Uh, we've had a lot of success with that in the past <coughs> with... Uh, over 200 people, or 250 bags, I should say, being handed out with like 150, 160 pounds of candy. So always goes out well. All of that event is sponsored by private donations throughout the community. So we definitely appreciate that and the support to put on community outreach programs like that. Uh, lastly, we had an officer start today, Cody Peterson, his name, first day. Uh, he's from just north of Fergus Falls, so we're excited about that. Um, look for a swearing-in ceremony in the near, very near future in a council meeting. And, um, Backgrounding another candidate right now, so again, hopeful that maybe that works out for us. But that's all I have. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Gary, anything to add tonight? Or? I'm excited about doing a workshop with you guys um, on the 7th and to talk about housing and uh, child care because obviously that's some of the biggest issues here. and. Directly is uh, under my 
department. So I'm looking forward to hearing what the community has to say and specifically what the council has to say and the direction that you'd like me to go with that particular department. Uh, we did have a housing uh, meeting at the University of Minnesota last week with uh, uh, Minnesota Housing Partnership and we had some panels and a good discussion there. I know Dale and some of the other ones that I saw were around there too and I got to hang out a little bit with you and hear about it. So we had some good uh, response at that, but I think that the whole Northwest Minnesota is working hard on housing right now. We have some really good, uh, of course, Tri-Valley, Marine Ham, and then they're also working with Child First Children's Finance. Uh, they'll also be attending our, our workshop, they're hoping to, because they all partnership together along with the Northwest Minnesota Foundation. So they have a lot of good plans already in place and some grants and studies out there that they'll probably share a little bit about, and uh, I'll wait for you to tell me which way you guys wanna go with that. Um, on the housing thing, we've talked to some developers and some other um, opportunities maybe for out there for that the Pirates 60 acres, and I was really excited to hear about how that those two ponds came because Corky took me on a drive around there, so they're beautiful out there, so I think that's just a great asset to that area up there. But that's all I have unless you have questions for me. Thank you. Ashley. Yes, Your Honor. I just wanted to remind everybody that to go and vote on November 8th, um, again, I just wanted to tell everybody that the ward polling locations for 1, 2, and 6 is at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, and 3, 4, and 5 is at First Presbyterian Church. Polls open at 7 a.m., and they close at 8 p.m., so go out and vote. Thank you, Ashley. Mm -hmm. Rich, anything from Widsat? Nothing tonight, Your Honor. Thank you. Start with Clayton tonight, anything? Yes, uh, I... Uh, attended the class that Carrie was talking about. It was uh, very informational. So I appreciate that uh, being held. And that's all I have to remember. Thank you. Steve? Uh, two things. Um, as a city, I think we need to look in. We have that plug in for electric cars on 2nd Street. Mm -hmm. Absolutely worthless. There's not a car that was 16, 18 hour charge. So if we could have staff uh, look in with Otter Tail, whatever, we put a credit card in there. Whatever um, the new people, the new cars, you got to have you know different charging. Great idea. We started. It's been there for a long time. But I fit probably four or five cars, plug in. <clears throat> so I walk over and talk to them, and they're like, "This thing's absolutely worthless because nobody's going to sit there for 14 hours and charge your car." But people coming in, you know, where it's advertising that we have one, <coughs> it's not state of the art. So something I think we need to look into as a city, and if we work on that, so we can get it updated. Maybe put a credit card machine on there. I don't think we should pay for it as a city, but they have them all over Grand Forks where they got a card machine reader and they plug in hour, two hour, 30 minutes, they're gone. But uh, the other thing I got is um, still looking for some type of award too. I mean, it, uh, it's getting down there now, but at the end of the day, if you're interested, I think, you know, I'd sure write your name in. <laughs> How many um, but, uh, posts think, do we need for a write in to be? One. Is that one? The rule is the highest vote getter prevails. So if there's one right in vote, that person prevails. If there are multiple, the highest vote getter prevails, and the vote get, highest vote getter has the choice to accept or not accept. If the vote getter accepts, that's the alderman or alder person for Ward 2. If the right in does not accept, then that's the end of it. We do not go down a list. That's my concern. I know people under, I've got to understand, it does cost the city a lot of money to, to start advertising and bring somebody in. And like I said, if anyone's <coughs> out there that's interested in it, you know, it's, it's a good place to really learn how your city runs and it's a great opportunity to serve the community. And anybody has any questions, I'd be love to sit down with anybody that's got somewhat any interest whatsoever. So I'd like to see somebody in this seat and and, and as well, I, I concur if anyone has questions, they can come and see me. Be glad to talk to them. I'll give them a primer. You have more on the job training. But anyone who is interested, uh, certainly welcome to come in. That's all I got. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Christy? Um, I also attended the uh, Minnesota Housing Partnership, <clears throat> Housing and Economic Development Workshop. And, um, it was really interesting to just kind of see some of the t statistics and see where we kind of hold up with a lot of other people in our region and some of the exciting things and grants and um, uh, just regional partnerships that have been happening to really grow um, our region. And so I'd love to be part of that. 
um, and made some pretty good connections in that regard. So i um, excited to see where that takes us going forward. Um, and then I will um, also be attending the uh, Midwest Minnesota Community Development Corporation um, uh, social on Wednesday, which is also another great uh, networking opportunity with people in our region for economic development. And I believe everybody was invited to that as well as in, in Boston, it starts at 4 p.m. So um, I would encourage other council members to go if they have the opportunity to do that. Um, I attended the Firehouse Open House um, with my kids and they loved it. It was great, a great turnout and um, you know, hats off to you, Tim and your team. Um, so uh, I appreciate seeing this type of community things going on. And so um, the one other thing I would say is I was really impressed by the amount of things that are going on for the Halloween um, <clears throat> holiday. And I know that CVB had put something out that kind of like showcased all the things that were happening in our community on the day or the day before. So it's exciting to see um, all those things for families and kids. So that's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Wayne? Well, <clears throat> just a quick welcome to Jordan. This is a short meeting, so. <laughs> <laughs> we got lucky. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thank you to, to Bob uh, Herkinoff for all, everything you did at that project out there with the uh, northeast corner, as we call it up there, and it, it does. I got relatives that live on there, and they've loved it. They watch you feed the fish and think that's great. Um, <laughs> And Tim, you weren't here last time. Congratulations on your announcement of your retirement. You're gonna like it, it's a good job. <laughs> <laughs> and then just remember to vote yeah, or vote on the 8th of uh, November. Thanks, Wayne. Tom? Just thanks for all your service, Tim. You've done a good job. Delane? Yeah, I, um, like to welcome Jordan. You know, it's, it's nice to see the new people come to the council meeting and introduce themselves. I hopefully that trend keeps up for every new person that we hire to the city. And then also congratulations to Tim. Um, you know, we've done a great job for our city for a lot of years, and it's much appreciated. That's it. All right, thank you, Joe. Yeah, I also want to thank Bob and uh, for everything he's done out there. My, my uh, oldest has enjoyed the fishing ponds quite a bit, and, and uh, Bob's been out there talking with all the boys since they were young and, and, uh, and letting them use some of his stuff when they're not smart enough to bring their own and they're freezing to death out there and, in the wintertime and stuff like that. But I just want to say you've done a great job out there. It's been a great thing for Crookston. And congratulations, Tim, on your retirement. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Don? Congratulations, my neighbor, Tim. Also to Bob for uh, donating uh, as a gift for the real property. Um, thank you very much for that. And we've been good friends for a long time. We used to lift weights at UMC and we gotta start doing that now but you're retiring, right? <laughs> and also I have heard from the downtown businesses in the Ward 4 residents for the good job that the police department is doing in responding to speeding and other issues that have been reported to me. So thank you very much, the police department chief. Very much, very much, thank you. That's it. All right, thank you. Uh, just kind of piggybacking off what Christy said, I also attended the housing and economic development workshop at the university and also doing the network open house with the Community Development Corporation in Boston on Wednesday. Um, I think it'll be great, so any council members can take it in. Uh, be very educational, I think. Also, thank Bob for all you've done up on that northeast corner, like Wayne, Wayne says. It's uh, I uh, see it used quite a bit. And also, Tim, on your retirement, I thought for sure we would be uh, roping you in that chair and dragging you out the door, but uh, <laughs> congratulations, and thank you for everything you've done. Yep. Uh, just a reminder, we will be having a Ways and Means shortly. Nothing else to come before council. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I start with Corky or Jake?
Um, to start with me, but Jake will be the prime time player tonight. Um, what we have in front of you tonight is a discussion about the campground. As you know, um, this has been a project that's been ongoing for a while. Let's say that. Uh, it does involve a legacy grant from the state of Minnesota, uh, which has been now extended for us. The original deadline was June 30th, 2022. <coughs> Uh, when Amy was here, she and I participated <coughs> along with others in a request to the legislator through their committee, Legacy Grant Committee, uh, to extend that deadline for the use of the funds, which they did, to June 30th, 2024. What we're here tonight to talk to you about is to get your direction on how you envision this camp uh, proceeding. Uh, there uh, are a number of possibilities. Just for your um, edification, originally a 33 campsite campground with loops, with paving, with pull-throughs. And as you know, that camp bids came in excessively high. So we went back to the drawing board. Uh, Scott Butt and Jake uh, Solberg did uh, yeoman's work on this. We've also, uh, Rich Clausen's been a part of this. Um, and Brandon Carlson, uh, Ryan, and myself, looking at where can we go? Uh, what can we do? Uh, just for a reminder, one of the big components of this original project was a bathhouse that would also serve as a storm shelter. <clears throat> We've revisited that, and it, it appears that uh, the storm shelter is just not a component that we maybe could afford. So the bathhouse has been uh, redesigned. Uh, we've received bids from local contractors uh, regarding just a stick-built uh, bathhouse, uh, and Jake will go more into that. We've also, he'll present to you uh, various options uh, for the 33, rebid it, or maybe downsize it uh, to accommodate <coughs> our funding uh, and what we have uh, through the legacy grant. Uh, we've been in meetings with um, Red Lake Falls, Thief River <coughs> Falls, East Grand Forks, uh, who all are participating. One time it was thought that Red Lake Falls was not going to participate, but they have said, yes, they are in. Um, over in East Grand Forks, they've completed part of their uh, project, but not <coughs> the entire project because they had the same difficulties that we did, more expensive than they had anticipated. The River Falls has completed essentially all of its projects uh, as a part of this, and we're continuing to work with Shannon Stassen, uh, who is really the initiator of this. He's been a part of our discussions. Uh, so, without further ado, we'll have uh, Jake Solberg here present all of the work that he and Scott Butt and the members of this committee have done. Can I ask one question before we start? Um, I know Just that... Ahead. We were told initially that this grant, um, if some people didn't utilize their portion, that it could be distributed amongst those who are utilizing it. So is there anybody at this point that is not utilizing it? Not at this point. Okay. Red Lake Falls, we thought, was perhaps not going to participate, <coughs> but their representative attended the meeting. Uh, but we were told that if they didn't, uh, we could get that grant money, but we'd have to meet their uh, match. Sure. Uh, but everyone is participating at this point. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Corky. Um, just kind of a little slideshow here, PowerPoint. Uh, this is our current campground. Uh, currently, we have 15 sites. Uh, three sites that have a drive-through. Um, we have seven 20, 30 amp electrical outlets with only 150 amp electric. <coughs> uh, we have two area, uh, tent area locations. Um, we have one women's bathroom, one men's bathroom. We each will have sinks, a shower, and three toilets. Um, we charge 29th. We figured on average we have four um, sites that are filled per night. Um, so annually that's 1,200, but in the, in the fall time, roughly in the September when harvest starts, we um, have a contract with express personnel. So um, people that work for farmers around the area, um, they'll come in and they'll stay in our campsites. Charge the 29th this year. We um, 
made $4,700 on that. So with that, we made roughly $14,500 with an expense of around 90. So that's our campsite. Campsites or campground that we have now. This was the 2021 bid project um, for our campground. This included a storm, shelter, bathhouse. Um, the bid price came at $892,000. The campground improvement bid price came at $1,303,820 with the total price of just over $2 million. Um, Brandon, Scott, myself, we've talked to some local contractors um, throughout this process the last couple weeks. Um, they're anticipating costs to either stay the same or go up. So nothing's going to change. Okay, can I ask, um, was there going to be sewer or water? Yes. There would be? Yep. Okay. Yep, we will all get into that. Yes. Okay. So, looking into this, this is obviously the, the same drawing that we saw before, but with this we would have a, a stick-built, non-sheltered bathroom. Um, I can go to <coughs> the title. This is kind of a layout that we drew up. Um, by any means, it's not professional or by bit set, but <coughs> it's kind of that, and a layout that we would like to go with. Um, you still have a mechanical room, you have a storage room. Each bathroom um, will have a shower, toilet, a sink, changing area, baby stations, um, hand dryers, and they're all ADA handicap accessible. So it's roughly a 1,200 square foot Bathhouse. Um, <clears throat> it's really hard to see. Do, were we? Do we get a copy of this? We can take a look at. Yeah, it? I was just going to ask. Can we? Can we start getting um, emails of all presentations so we can look at them? It's just really hard to see the the drawings. Oh. Um, <clears throat> so are you? There's going to be one men and one women's well, bathroom. All unisex bathrooms. Oh, okay. If you look. I don't know, it's hard to see. Well, what we have is obviously with the storage room here, with the mechanical room here, and then these are four different separate bathrooms okay. that would be uh, 12 by 12 or 12 by 15. 12 by 12 or 15. 15 by 12, 88, 88 accessible along, and they would be unisex. Awesome. So you'd walk in from the outside? Yep. Yes. And they all have their own door? Yes, they would all have their own doors. I appreciate this. I think my biggest concern when we initially presented this was that there would be no family bathroom, so this definitely addresses that need. So. Yep, they're, they're all family bathrooms. That's awesome. But before, all they weren't. They were right. men and right. women. So. This is a redesign. All yeah. family bathrooms, all unisex, all equally accessible at all times to any individuals with showers. Nice. Cool. So with plan A, it would be that bathroom that I showed with 33 campsites. So it's the same original design for the campground itself. Um, seven drive-through sites, which leaves you 26 like regular pull-in sites. Um, we anticipate to have each, um, each site have a full hookup um, with a 20, a 30, and a 50 amp of electrical, water, and sewer. Um, we had a corridor study. I talked with Reed Hoodman out of East Grand Forks, and um, roughly 20% of the campground should be ADA accessible. Um, so with 33 sites, that's roughly six and a half. So six sites would be handicap accessible for um, any camper, right? So concrete pad um, for wheelchairs and, and stuff like that. So this is plan A. Um, we'll get to an estimated cost just down the, the few slides. So. Um, plan B, um, same bathhouse, um, but we take the northeast corner out. <laughs> um, the northeast corner would be gone. So we would have 21 sites, seven drive-through sites, and then 14 pull sites. And then I, to mention, Scott, if you want to go on the east side, those four drive-throughs <coughs> would be, you, you could consider them so yep, these would be full drive-throughs, but you can also split them in two. Okay. Now these three here would still be just full, just full drive-through. 
Okay. But then you'd have the ability to add four more at any time. Or, you know, I mean, heavy days, you can break them off. So, with uh, roughly 20% ADA, four sites would be handicapped accessible for uh, this plan. Any questions so far? Are they going uh, with concrete for the drive through and pads and stuff, or what? They would go with their pavement, I believe. Brandon, would that be a pavement, right? Pads or gravel. Gravel. Except for the ADA. Except for the ADA. The roads would be pavement. Is the major difference between these two just cost? Okay. We figured roughly if you take the north east side out, you're cutting into a third, so roughly four hundred and thirty thousand sure. dollars. Could you come in from Riverside there to still access that? Um you can get to about here. The road has been taken out, it's all grass now. Um so would we take a road out of there <coughs> completely out of there? That would be something. Is there a need for it? I guess, you know, that's why I'm just curious. Well, there is, there is that slab down here still that a lot of the old skate park that a lot of people right. still like to use. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> along with them, we have the Frisbee Golf, golf in there. So mm -hmm. it's kind of nice to have that access point, especially from a maintenance standpoint. But now with that, be a road that would pass straight through <coughs> or just go into that area. Right now the road would just come into here and go through here into the campground. We would, we would not use Yeah, I was just Wasn't concerned, that at one point? concerned wow. about the um, if we had it run all the way straight through, more vehicles running through there. Correct. Yeah. Now the other thing with this is then this is your road that goes is the loop that's still that's down there now that accesses your uh, the boat landing. Right now the plan is in this in plan A it is to pave this. Plan B this would stay here but it would stay as gravel. Is there any discussion about and I know the mayor we you had mentioned something at one point about the landing not really being the way. That would be most conducive. I think to that uh, our odds are better as far as getting a new uh, boat ramp or launch down there is after it's built. Sure. I've had discussion years ago with the DNR, and they seem to have all kinds of money for trails, but for this kind of thing, I think with the boat ramp, we it have to be completely moved. I don't think. I don't, I'm not an expert, but basically getting down on that boat ramp, it should be facing up into the current. That way you don't get all that sed sediment in there. So would that need to be taken into consideration as they're building this out? I think uh, our odds, mm -hmm. me personally, I guess I could talk, I'd have a discussion with Shannon to get the right connections again, but I mean, it was years ago when I talked to someone, I think from Bemidji, and I don't think they were going to really do anything, but I think our odds are better trying to get funding for a new launch would be after the, to do the improvements to the campsite. Sure. That's personal. I could be wrong. Yeah. Is there been any, any discussion about yeah, that with you guys? Yeah. I know that's kind of on top of the stuff. But now the, uh, the people <coughs> in the meeting that we had said after we do this, they recommended it, highly recommended, that we come back a second round of funding after this is completed. Okay. Has there been any thought? Because I know somebody mentioned to me one time, you know, the park is, it floods, whatever you want to call it. I heard it's seepage, flood, whatever. How about taking that inside dike down? And when it floods, it can run off when the river goes down. And they make it, make it like a beach area. I don't think the DNR would let you up. There, yeah. there was no wouldn't talk hurt, of that. One hurt to ask, you know. Yeah. It wasn't. I re we haven't talked about that. Yeah. That. Um, but I guess if we're going to do all these improvements, these are things to me that should be brought up and see if they're going to anything possible to do it. Because otherwise, you know, if you got all that water sitting in there, it's got to go someplace. You pump it out or whatever. This way, you could just run right out with it. The benefit of the dikes there, Tom, is if you look at the tree level, when the ice goes through, it comes through. 
at the level or higher than the dike. So if we took those dikes out and ice went through at ground level, it's gonna shear all our electrical and everything off at the ground. Right now, the ice for the most part goes over all of the fixtures. And if it, it, it sets, it might sit down on them when the water leaves the park, but I, I think you'll end up with a lot more damage if you were to remove that outer levee. If, if you're down there, look at the trees. The ice damage is about four to six feet from ground level. And that's because of the levees around the park there. Was there any discussion on that as far as the flooding itself of reimbursing us or how do we, I mean, it's gonna cost a ton of money for cleanup every year. So at the end of the you know day, what is there any discussion about grants to help subsidize that or? We talked about um, budgeting throughout the years as the as the park uh, gets utilized to you know the main damage is the gravel washing out on the paths. Gravel washing, potentially electric posts. There was there was you no take discussion. Some of that out though, don't you? Yeah. No discussion in particular about grants, but we certainly could look at that. But there was discussion about the annual upkeep, how we finance it operationally. All right, and that's got to be a big part of that because I mean it's, you know, gravel is not cheap if you're going to do that many lots of gravel every year and laying it down and leveling it and tamping it and that's a that's going to add up in a hurry. I hope that regardless of what we do, that there's a lot more or better advertising, and I know that probably will be part of that legacy piece. Um, but I do wonder because we don't have sewer and water right now, correct? So that also, I know that I've heard that there's a lot of campers that go to East Grand because we don't have that op that opportunity. So I'm hoping that this will also maybe. That was a major part of our discussion was increased marketing, tying in with the CVB, tying in with the DNR, tying with MnDOT about signage and also brochures and just letting it be known that this is a fully operational and fully equipped campsite uh, with dumps, water, electricity, all of those kind of things, very much part of our discussions with both the representatives of the legacy grant and within the group that we have here. We also talked about, Brandon and I and Scott, our community talked about putting an actual dump station uh, potentially in the campsite right now it's located off campus. So, mm. so the options are there. How will, that, how will that work if that thing floods and you've got a dump site in it? I mean, that's, that's going to be a, well, you're pretty hard to seal that, seal, seal it tight. Well, it's going to take a lift station, so obviously in the spring we just wouldn't have the power onto the lift station. Yeah, but you say in the spring, I mean, we get a couple of five, six inch rains in the summertime it flooded. Yeah. You know, I mean. Uh, well, yeah, the. I don't think the ground, the park floods, floods in the, in from a from a rain standpoint. We're just talking about having the dump station like is on East Robert, giving you know, for the most part they shouldn't need to dump because they're gonna have full hookups. But let's just say that somebody came in and wanted to dump, they wouldn't have to leave the camp <coughs> to dump anyway. So each, each each campsite would have the full electrical, full water, and and then for flooding purposes, Chief Broder gave me some numbers. Um, since 97, uh, we've had 28 crests. Um, park has flooded 12 times. Is the numbers that Chief Broder gave me since 97. Have we done any ground studies there? Because now you know you're talking about putting water and sewer lines under the ground. Now that park has got to be a lot of silt. Is there how much movement is in that ground? Is you don't want to have a whole bunch of sewer lines and stuff cracking and busting and pulling apart. And Rich, what studies did we do on that? We did do. We had to do a couple. We, we did an earlier study on that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know, burial grounds or anything like that. That came back clean. Um, that was the only one study that we did there. But as far as the, the ground, you know, if we can bury something in, in silty as opposed to clay, I'd take that any day. It's the clay that's going to swell and, and freeze and heave and cause problems. If you've got silty, sandy soils, it's not going to move around all that much. So. Okay. Oh, and that's right. That, that was the other one. We had to do a wetland delineation, and I came back clean, too. Thank you. Our estimated costs um, for the both the plan A and plan B, the two hundred eighty dollars per square foot for concrete for a twelve hundred square foot building. We went with the highest. Sorry, two hundred fifty dollars. We went the highest cost, roughly three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars for the backhoe. Is what our estimation is. So that's a dramatic decrease from the original plan. Um, Thirty-three campsites. Roughly one million six hundred twenty-nine seven hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Total cost would be just shy of two million. And then you can see the plan B is a little bit cheaper, um, five hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars, five hundred and eight. Cost difference between having thirty-three sites to twenty-one sites. Again, these are estimated costs from contractors that we talked to. So how many how many sites do we have now? Fifteen. Fifteen. So, is there ever since you've been here? Can anybody ever remember? Do we fill them all ever? Yes, we have. Um, so, a lot of times during our start, we used to do when the uh, car show was down there. All the sites. I mean, we'd have people parked all the way out. Um, we have not filled in a couple of years, but if you take a look at the product we're offering right now, as opposed to what we would be offering, it's, it's night and day, and you've got a better chance to fill. So, based on what you're saying, the, um, I mean, having a 33, um, site one, would that, um, I mean... The potential fill on that, and is it is it feasible, or be, because of all the amenities that we're offering now? Yeah, well, personally, I worked at Will County Park for four years with the ground uh, <coughs> person in charge, and we've always filled. Of course, it's seasonal, but the campsite were always full, and there was times that people would come through looking for a spot. Well. Usually we're full, but they say they stopped by Cruxton and they didn't care for it. Now, if we got a nice, I mean, a nice setup like that, I don't think they'd have any problem keeping 33 people. 33 so then, so then, based on what you're saying there, then is so what? What what is the potential revenue then on per site? I mean, if I mean, if we're talking about. We, we could possibly be cutting ourselves on, on half. I mean, we could be getting more revenue then. So what is the revenue per site? So we kind of did revenue based on a 21 site. So we figured if we, right now we're roughly half full, so we went half full out of our 21 site. So 11, um, 11 sites per night is what we figured. Um, these are the numbers that I've, I did. I talked to um, the city administrator in my hometown because they just recently built a brand new campsite three years ago. And I've talked with Reed Hutton on his Beach Garden Forest. So those are the two people I've been talking to. So I kind of base my numbers on what they've done. Um, so roughly, if we have 11 people per night, that's 550 um, a night <coughs> um, times 165 days because we roughly be open for May till October. You're looking at bringing in $90. So um, right now, what are you charging per site? $20 per night. And then you could probably increase that then to $40? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> With the <laughs> amenities? <laughs> it would be $40, and then your weekends would be a little bit, $5 more. And then if you have any extras, which people do, um, you know, like if you have a pet, it's $5 per night. 
around the tabletop, more firewood, other bundles, charging for that. So these are the rates that we kind of base off right now. So you're saying think, uh, you're saying with um hold on a second with uh if we went with uh thirty three um, spots a potential revenue per season would say ninety thousand ninety thousand twenty one sites not thirty three twenty one sites so what would it be on thirty three sites because that's the plan that we kind of want to go with in a sense is we don't know well, if we have the potential to put well let's 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 pencil it out I mean so what's the return on our investment if we if we do this I mean that's the that's the question here because. <laughs> Typical return on investment, say, would be ten years. So, could we, could we, make this? Could we pay for our our portion of it within ten years of renting out thirty three, you know, thirty three sites? I mean, let's not automatically think small here when we can when we can do a good thing for the city of Crookston, and have and have thirty three sites filled is what my thought is. So, so what would that? What would our return on our investment be in say ten years versus what our total cost is? Is it is it even out? I don't have numbers in front of me. So. I mean if you're gonna base it off of fifty percent, which we based off the twenty one, now you base fifty percent off of thirty three, so <clears throat> you know you're looking at roughly sixteen per night at forty dollars a night, that's gonna the, the, the problem that I've that I see in a lot of projects that the city has done whether it be the school or whatever they always say after the fact oh, I wish we'd have done I wish we'd have went I wish we'd have got the extra basketball court and then we all kinds of different things so I'm thinking that if we can if we can pencil it out that our our return can be somewhat reasonable, then I, I don't see there's no reason why we can't look at the 33 site. If you assume the same occupancy, you're adding a third, let's just say, so that's another 30,000 a year, so potentially 300,000 in 10 years is what the revenue would be. And it was 500,000 was But we cut. haven't taken into consideration the expenses there at all. Right. So, I mean, you look, you know, so it's not we have, to have an idea of where we are for expenses of this thing because, I mean, when I figured out five years ago when we looked at this, it was a 25 to 30 year payback at best. And I mean, we can drum it up however you want it, but at the end of the day, until you get all the expenses, the costs of building this thing, and I mean, we're going off crazy numbers because of COVID and whatever when we first started dealing with this, and they went up 50%, so okay, it's not even feasible, but... You know, our labor still goes up and so, so everything that goes to take care of this thing. And that's my concern is we got to make sure we are set in a, you know, a money number wise of how we're going to pay for labor and materials. And because this is going to have to get redone once, <coughs> if not twice minimum a year. Well, I mean, should we have an estimated cost on what the labor is going to be? I mean, well, I mean, should, should, should that be yeah. something we should be talking about? So for a full time, because we want to hire a full time, um, they would start off at seventy thousand seven hundred and fifty five dollars. So that's just the revenue. That's the full compensation full package, compensation not package. just wages. Not just wages. That's what I'm in. <laughs> so as a case, so as far as the health, now if they were to hire somebody that could stay there during the season. That's how they did it uh, at Polk County Park. When you're a park host, you uh, get your camp site free, yep. and then we're, and then wages. Right. Have you so checked with the county to see? I've what just I've checked. I've did some investigating around Minnesota, not just Barrett County. Um, I looked at campground hosts, and I just kind of put up duties, like you said. Everyone that I've saw, <coughs> you know, they they stay there for free. Their wages are free, they're, but they're conducting, they're working. They're working to live there, right? So that's an option that I've put on the table with Corky and Scott and everyone involved. Um, but I still think we need someone there to wage it and, and help with things around. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, um, 
that's a big part of the job too. It's not just gonna you need you need a full time staff there. Right. I think like East Grand Fork says like three full time <coughs> staff, and the then they have the house. Side though is they they run through to B and I as well. Right. It's like city and B and I really. Right. So, um, but yes, I have looked into Camp Down Hope, and that was a long discussion I had with the city administrator. You know, they were when they built their Camp Down Two, they were in the same boat as well. How are we gonna run this? Who's gonna run it? They hired another full time park and rec. Their park and rec runs it. You know, they're running. Seven days a week when they can't get open, but they have a host who take in um, campers and to teach them and to let them know what's going on in the city and where the gas stations and grocery stores and help pick up litter, whatever they got to do, right? So, um, but yeah, that's a long discussion I had. So do they just have one or they got two? Hosts? Yeah. They have. And they have three, it's a smaller town than us, but they have three full time um, park and rec staff plus their student staff. I mean, that's the you know, numbers I like with Delane. So I'd like to see okay, if we do the 33, it's this much. So we're saving $500,000, but to do plan B, but is that, you know, that feasible? Is that the way you Right, and then go? there's got to be a, a ratio that says, okay, if we go with the big one, this is our payback, this is what it's going to cost us to run it. Because if it's 21, it should cost less to run it, right? Theoretically, so it's, it's, it's a cost efficiency worth the 33. And, and not, not to uh, <coughs> be Debbie Downer or anything, but the, when we had the meeting with the, the, the grant people from the state, they said that one of the big things that's going on right now with the campgrounds and other people that are doing this is they're all downsizing right now to get the grant spent with the idea that they're going to come back to do a phase two. Now, you and I both know phase two a lot of times never happens. <clears throat> never happens. So you have to weigh that out. Are we going to do phase two if we don't do it? Or do we do it all in one? You know, that comes back to what you guys want to do. And obviously, maybe, you need numbers. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's a such a thing as that we, we, we um, put in, we don't, we don't, um, because right now, what do we have done? We don't have, we have electricity for all the campers. Yes. And we don't have sewer. We do not have sewer. We do not have water. To the, to so, the so what if we develop 33, but only take the 21 and do the you know the the water and the sewer and the electricity for the 21 and but we have we have the 33 sites and 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 then you charge accordingly so maybe we but then with then in the plans to if we ever do a phase two then it's easier because they're there you know instead of like okay yeah it's never you know yeah, That's I think like having like designated like tent camping and then like trailer camping, and yeah. I think I know what you mean. Like twenty one sites with a full hookup, twenty thirty <coughs> water sewer, and then and the rest of them like we have now. <laughs> yeah, you know. You know they 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 have that in East Side and in Silver Bay they yeah. do have like Silver Bay I think they have ten sites where it's just electrical. There's no water. There's no nothing. You know, but I mean we got the space. Well, I think even in East Grant, I don't even know if they have they have power in some of those tent yeah, sites. Yeah, it's just a. It's just a site. It's just a site. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but they have like a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah right. When I look at East Grand Forks, when I drive by, I mean, them guys are, the guys, are, they're getting used a lot, and a lot of them would probably be in Crookston if we had a better. If we had sewer well, water. When <laughs> Crooks in it, when East Side is full, a lot of the campers I've heard ask, where's the next available campsite? They say Crooks <coughs> they, they got full hookups, yeah. and if they, they say no, they don't want to come here. Right, right. But the other, I got a couple questions. Um, is there room for primitive camping? You know, people come in for want to do tents or? Right, yes. right. Yeah. Yeah. Take a look at the map. <clears throat> you know, right, that's right now, right here, this is tenting. This is your tent area. Um, right here, if you come back here where the uh, the hill is, where it has the power box on it, there are sites, camping sites all around that, all around that hill. There are also tent sites right, right here. Right now, 
So my other, thinking outside the box, my other question is you mentioned like uh, firewood and stuff. Could we update the uh, ranger shack to maybe sell some like the firewood, maybe ice? Uh, I think that's, that's yes, we, we, just, we haven't discussed ice, but we have discussed firewood. Um, you know, if you can go to Holiday right now and get firewood, there's got to be a way to to buy bundles or to buy <laughs> yeah. or to I, sell. So I think the state park one too, like they have to use the bundles. They can't like purchase right. wood outside of. Yeah. Yeah, um, they and they just have like a fenced in area that they have padlocked. Right so. now in any campground, you have to use the green. Yeah, you can't bring firewood in. Right. Right. You gotta use what's there. But I was saying, I, I don't know what other essentials you can sell out of this guard shack or the ranger area. Yeah. I just think it I mean, you'd have to purchase, obviously, an ice system. But well, exactly, but it... Keep the pool and keep the stuff. You know, I, I always thought that this here campground was supposed to try and uh, increase business downtown, and now we're, we're taking business away from downtown. We're taking away uh, from our convenience stations and stuff for your ice. They're still going to go to convenience but stores. Listen, we're, we're, if we don't have it, they're not even coming here. So we're not taking business. We're not even getting the business at all if they if we don't have a spot for them to come. Uh, so, Perky, what is the dollar amount that we're getting for this? Um, there's a grant for, I believe it's $1.036 million. Uh, that's the legacy grant. Okay. Our match for that, uh, we had <coughs> basically $436,000. But we do have, um, I don't want to say it's found money, but Ryan? No, initially back when this all started, the funds were put into the park and rec budget to do both phases. So that was the Gently Bridge and then our campground. Um, so with that, then we have in this year's budget for Jake 460,000 for finishing this campground, and then we also reserve 385,000 that is set aside up in our reserves for this. Okay. That totals 825,000. That is reserved here for our portion. So that would give us a good idea to take that number. Get a, what we're going to estimate it's going to cost to maintain this thing and give you a gross revenue of, or a deficit, and how many years is it gonna take to recover that? Right. I mean, that's what we need to look at. The bottom line is, that, you know, whether we do small, big, if we can't afford to do it, you know, why are we sitting here? Right. Are you yeah. wanting then, um, <coughs> Jake, to give you numbers for the 21 and the 33, that so you can compare them yes. side by side yes. and see what we're looking yeah, for? We can, and then we can forecast really of the that. revenue based on half occupancy, right, for both? I, I think that's your best bet is to base it off of half occupancy yeah. because you know, I don't want to say right. I, I just think if you try to base it off of full occupancy, you're you're setting numbers that are just going right. to be. I don't want to be like where we, you know, the pools that we own the pool, but at the end of the day, this thing's costing us right. ten pole of what we're told it was going to cost. And us. just for your information, as we progress through our discussions. We took a conservative view of 50% occupancy throughout all of our uh, discussions. Uh, we're, we did not do 100% or 80 um, because what we thought was with increased advertising, with increased awareness of this facility and increased amenities, we could get to 50%. And one of the things that the Legacy Committee said is, we've alluded to it, but once you get it built, if you see you're filling it up, that's a real positive to come back and say, "This we need more, as opposed to overbuilding it to start with. Yeah. That's <coughs> why I was like <coughs> suggesting, like, still have the spots available if we ever want to <coughs> um, improve them, but let, let's just have the spots and not just build the 21 and just box yourself in to, as, well, you're not, well you're, the land well, is always going to be available. <coughs> yeah, the land's already there. You're just adding gravel. You don't want any amenities to it. Just for example, have all these sites <coughs> full, right? Electrical, sewer, yep. water. Yeah. And then have these sites just electric. Right. 
criminal. Great. Right. 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 Okay. okay, but in the case, and Tom, you can probably attest to this too, that uh, I've been at the park, uh, Bow County Park, for 14 years. Yeah. <coughs> How often do you see a tent? Not very often. Yeah, but that's lake. I mean, I think the river's going to get more use, usage and, you know, we can improve the boat landing and, you know, we got a nice accent at Gently now. You know, I don't think it hurts to have a few tent sites, just see what happens. Well, tent sites don't really cost you anything. Uh, well, and I think the other thing, too, is maybe that's your phase two, going back to the legacy. You're do that anyway. At the uh, end of the other, day. I got another question. You can expand the campground, you know. We're looking out for the community, too. You got the Falfers out there that are, were spitting tax when they seen this development, the 33 site. Where are we going to fall? You know, they like Cal that area. They Castle will, Park did put something in for Falfers. Am I, am I correct on that? Uh, well, they had taken it out. And that's why they got upset, and then they put it back in. Okay. No, if you look at the faulting, yeah, it's, it's if you look at the fault course down there, I have moved some of the holes to adjust to the camper. Mm -hmm. Took that and adjusted some of the holes so that you weren't going through the middle of the campground. <coughs> so you weren't, you know, so that we, you're basically <coughs> on the fault here on the outside. Okay. And then you're coming up towards the library. So you're over on the, you know, you're basically, you're coming in on the river, you go up on the dike, and then you're back in. To me, I don't think it's a bad thing to keep the fault course down there. No, I don't either. It gives you, we, and we can adjust, we got land to adjust. It also, <coughs> keeps you, but you never know, you get somebody that may come in there and say they're on a faulting trip. Because of our two fault courses, we had a, a fault tournament here this fall that brought in people brought in 35 people from out of town. Or, you know, the, <coughs> the bro, Bo Brody brought in 35. For, so you may get people coming into camp in your campground that that's what they're coming for. Yeah. So I think that's the idea. That's ideal. Just going back a step, okay? Have you get, I, if, if these guys are coming to us at a board looking for money, have you guys worked out a, you know, a business plan with anybody? Have you worked with SBDC or any of the, the, the folks that do this? Have you uh, done the homework on it? That's, to me, us trying to figure out how many spots or how many you're going to do, I think they should be coming up with, with what they anticipate. And I mean, you might not hit it dead on, but you know, whether you got 21 spots or you got 33 spots, you still got the same amount of property to keep care of you got the same amount of, of bathrooms to take care of you got the same amount of people working there as host to take care of it where are your differences it's the extra you'd have for for plumbing or electricity that type of thing is it going to have to have a bigger bathhouse you know those are the comparisons <coughs> not, not bathhouse but a pump house or a lift station those are the kind of things that you can compare as to what size you want to make the place. And so I, I think there's some more homework to be done here that, that you know, to sit down and, and just put those two side by side. And over here you got fixed costs and over here you got expected, you know? And I mean, if, if you put in infrastructure for 33 places, does it cost you that much more to have it laying there dead? But you got it in there if you ever want to hook, so you don't have to go back and redig that. I mean, it probably is very cheap. I mean, we used to lay out when we were putting concrete in, we would lay out more conduit than we needed, so that when you're adding pumps or if you're adding lights, you got the conduit in there and you don't have to start from square one. So, I mean, things like that to just sit down and, and figure. I mean, you've got a lot of money coming from different places. Um, we want to use it wisely. <coughs> like I say, you don't want to use what you don't need to, but there again, you hate to come back and say, God, you know, we should have made it 10 more lots easy. Yeah. yeah. But can we get some numbers from, you know, instead of we're just pulling these out of the air, and it's tough to do. It's, I mean, you can, anybody can multiply real quick in their head and get you close, but what's it actually going to cost you, I mean, on some of this stuff? I mean, 
that's to, to, even, to even break it down within a budget year. I mean, if we're if if we're just talking one year, is this thing gonna take us backwards in the budget, or is it gonna be a net profit at the end of the when we're doing our budgets? But you know, and who's gonna share in the profits, and who's gonna share in, in the expense? I mean, you know, if it comes up short, how are you gonna finance that? I mean, there's just got to be some some more thing. It's, it's a great deal, a great plan. I like it. I I would like to see you know the whole thing go through because. Like I say, I don't see many people using tents, and it doesn't take much room to throw 20 tents over in a corner over here if you're not giving them electricity or any of that kind of stuff. And I just want to make sure we address the, the cost issue because that's a lot right. of people. I don't want to spend taxpayer money every single year. This is not benefiting the taxpayer. Right. Not whatsoever. Well, so you just say well, about it, the. It, it, uh, it is. I think the economic you know, development of that. So you have those people now the, utilizing you know, the restaurants and the gas look, stations and the grocery let stores. Let me finish, please. So if you if you take the you got one vendor that this is huge to, and that's Marin Crystal. That's you know he had brought that up that you know them guys are all about this thing, and she's come and talked to me a million times about it. She's like, where are we at? And I, I think I've talked to Corgi many times about where are we at with this thing, because it is important. Don't get me wrong. The end of the day, if it's going to be a 10-year, 20-year, 30-year huge deficit, you know that's not good either because we have an 18% levy today. <coughs> you know you're going to throw another 25, 30 thousand dollar loss on this for the next 25 years. There's another 1% so, levy. I mean, it, it, we got to look at the big picture. Of so where you, do we draw the line? Can, can you can you get numbers from East Grand Forks of of um, how much revenue that they make on their campground a year? Do they, do they make you know, a lot of that, Dwayne, you're looking at, or Dwayne, you're looking at apples and oranges on a lot of stuff. They're, they're by a bigger city. They're by the river. They're by the interstate. You know, the, by the restaurants. And there's a know. lot of Canadian traffic. Yeah. Right. That, Look at Thief yes, River Falls yeah. and their campground that they got there by their Dairy Queen or whatever. Yeah. Always full. You're taking a chance. And we're doing it because we got the river and you got your rafting and you got, you know, canoeing or whatever. And you're hoping to bring folks into town and and showboat the town a little bit but in essence i mean i guess how do you you know yeah. that's what i'm saying if you get someone like christine and that's what we're paying her for is to you know be there as a guideline i'm sure they've got examples of of people that have rv parks there's what was the guy thinking of that was going to build it the other one up by mm -hmm. castle, castle park you know, he wasn't planning on going to lose twenty thousand dollars a year. So I mean, how do you sit down and figure it out? And you're not buying the property, and you're you got most of the stuff is going to get paid for on a grant. You sure as hell ought to be able to come out on it. Yeah. If you were going to do it individually, Tom, would you turn that down a million three or whatever, and to help you with this in free land and say, here you go? Depends on what what I was going to do. I, I look at like Polk County Park. There's thirty some thirty some seasonal sites that we pay a pretty healthy fee on you don't have that here so you know what do you I mean? that's what i'm saying you got to come up with what's your catch going to yeah. be well, well i don't we i don't want it to be i don't want it to be another one of these things that we build and then we come back and say well these things never make money so they just cost you money <coughs> i mean i don't want that i if want you're building it for your rate, own people that's uh, a little different uh, a rink is a little different end. than Way and we talked about it. They talked about having sites set aside for the whole summer. So it'd be just like a Polk County Park or anything else. There would be sites set aside for people that possibly are snowbirds or want to come back to their hometown and stay for. But I didn't think they no had no. anything for. They didn't. We talked about it when we oh. talked about the campground last time about having sites like that. Well, when you say Crystal it. Sugar, you know how many so campers many that were out at the that? camp or we're the doing, trailer. Uh, and did you see the well, size of those things and the cost? Well, that's never been brought up. I mean, it, it, it was talked about. I don't know. I mean, it didn't say yes or no, but it was talked about. So what I hear you're saying to us is go back, check with other areas about how they, how they sell their campsites, how they manage them and their costs, because I think the work that, that the committee did is good work, but we want a broader spectrum of analysis. We want to look at other camps, sites, how they work it, maybe consult with the SBDC, 
but get some more specific numbers. Is but, that what you're telling us? But yes. could you partner with uh, with Travis and his canoes? Could you trap, you know, with the others that have have got businesses that are wrapped right, made just for Mm -hmm. camping? I think the big part is the other part is is marketing. We've got to have part of that in our budget to market this thing. That's the only way that this thing, well, that's not free. So what is that going to cost? So we we can go back and we can take what you've said and we can look to other area parks, but not just there, not just this area and get some more specific numbers, break it down more explicitly. Mm-hmm. Here's what it's gonna cost us to have a campground host. Here's what it's gonna cost us to have an additional individual and then compare the 33 to the 21. Oh. What, and one other thing, why? I, I don't know if there's a way to do this, but it'd be nice to have, talk to, there's gotta be an organization out there that campers use but why do people, why do campers pick one campground over the other? Oh, what there's amenities there's do there's they like? There's plenty of data on that. Yeah. 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 We can get that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would like to see something that is self-sustaining, if nothing else. But I also would like to see us be a little bit more realistic. Like, one full-time person, like, they're not going to be there 24-7. So it's <coughs> more like two part-time people, I mean, that are kind of taking the shift so they can cover the whole week. And then, like, for the hosting, like, East Grand Forks, there's no, you don't get paid for that. You just, get your yourself. spot is free, and that's how it works. What, so. do they, what do they pay now for that guy that's down to the camp? Guy? The Rangers? The yeah. Ranger, yeah. I mean, and they're the down there. And, right now? You know, so I mean, what's it cost you just for, how many hours are they down there? So right now, we're paying. You know, so I mean, you, you plug that in and maybe you need to yeah. get three, you know, that right. type of, so you can use some numbers that you're going to be realistic. Yeah. But like I say, if you can, you, you know, working some deals with the Grand Theater or working a deal with the canoe guys or. Well, we, we, and we did talk about that, yeah. how readily it would be <coughs> for those campers to go up to the Grand Theater, to go uptown, to, to eat uptown, to the pool, to the pool, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, and we did talk about that. We didn't put numbers to that, but it does have a positive, can have a positive impact for Crookston uh, overall. Buying groceries, getting gas, Working going to the Valley. theaters. Get yeah. a bus down there, bring them to all over town, drop them off, spend money. Yep. Exactly. So. so that, we don't have precise numbers, but believe me, that was certainly part of the discussion uh, for that. Um, but I think with Jake and and um, the rest of the committee, we can get more specific. We can uh, seek that out, but we do want to start going on it. We want to try to uh, get it bid out uh, because this is the time to bid. Yeah. According to everybody we've spoken to, Rich and, and others, you're bidding now, they're hungry for spring. What's, so your, time, to, what's your timeline on this, Corky, for now? Twenty June thirtieth of twenty twenty four. That's when the checks have got to be written and yep. done. Done. Yep, done. Done. Um, as far as the stick built bathhouse, the you know the original was designed by Wood Seth for a storm shelter prefab concrete building. So um, I talked to Rich, and it's about um, eight thousand to redesign a stick built with the fam well, I'll call it a family or you know individual bathrooms are you guys comfortable with moving forward with the redesign so that when we do get all these uh, projections hashed out for you that we can be ready we we really need to be able to bid this well, by it, December because the bathhouse is going to be there whatever 33 right. 21 yes. right. 6. Whatever. I think, I so think the stick that, house is a good idea. I the, mean, the, go ahead. Uh, I think it's a good idea to have the stick house and the way it's laid out. I think it's exceptional. Um, storm shelter wise, city hall is right here. It's a it's a storm shelter. It's 
block and a half away and it's bigger and, it's bigger. and so I don't think that's like a selling point to the campground as a storm shelter when you have something like this that's open anyway during a, a bad <coughs> storm or a tornado so yeah, that's a good point you know I, I think uh, I think saving that type of money when we start talking about projected numbers is definitely the way to go to save that kind of cash on I would hope it tried to it maintenance free everything. I mean, something you know where it's, you're not gonna have paint and maintain steel and siding and steel it. roofing. And yeah. yeah. There was nothing, Corky, that was on that grant that included that had to be part of that. I thought there was no. some to talk about. No, we could. We've spoken to them about this, the grant administrators, and they said yes. This is a redesign. It's perfectly <laughs> permissible. Yeah. And is there any federal money for a safe bathhouse? There, they, we've looked at, there's ain't a lot of grants for storm shelters out there. I like the idea of it. Well, and this, this storm shelter here is almost as close to some campsites to the, the uh, storm oh, shelter right. there. This is more solid, this is readily available, and it's bigger. Bigger. It makes but no we sense. have 33 campsites. They're not all going to fit in that bathhouse or that storm shelter, but they could fit in here. Exactly. So, I mean, why spend that kind of money on something that's not going to be completely suitable for what's happening? So, what? so do, do we need direction for Brandon? Is that what? We are, are we in consensus? on course yes. with getting the redesign, getting it prepared for bids? Yes. Yes. So yes. we go stick built. We're going that option now, interior portion, easy to clean. I mean, all maintenance free, easy to clean, spray <coughs> down. <coughs> oh, no, the power <coughs> washer. <coughs> take a hose in there. Take a hose and just. Okay. That's, okay. That's what we have to have. Yep. Okay. And I, I, and I put hand dryers on there so we don't have paper towels. Paper towel expense. <coughs> oh, yeah. <coughs> it all adds up. So. Personally, I think we should. In your budget planning, something like this should be some kind of cameras on that bathhouse, so there's no graffiti, spray painting, people messing with it. Because it is kind of up in the dark area there. Um, I think and better lighting, some cameras. What I, like that. I don't there's... know that we've talked to Chad about it yet, but um, <laughs> the, uh, it would be good to have a really good Wi-Fi system down there. So yeah. I make I make yeah, the recommendation absolutely. we move forward with the redesign for the bathhouse stick built. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Everybody is everyone good with that? Yep. Yeah. Got a consensus of that? Yeah. <laughs> good. Thank you. All right. So I guess. Kind of got marching orders. What council's expecting? Yeah, well that's that really kind of what we were. Sure, we get it. Was yeah. to get yeah. marching orders. Directions. You know, once it went, once it came back the first time, you're looking at that number and you're going, well, where do we go from here? And what does everybody want? Sure. So I like to see with like Chrissy and a bunch of people have said though, it's got to eventually be self-sufficient. We cannot fund this thing year after year after year. And that's why we, I don't want another pool because right. we got bad information on that thing and it's killing us. Financially, whatever, and this I don't want to pass down to two other councils down the road of won't easily approve this thing because it's bad business. And I, I know it's tool. Yeah. That's a good point. But. Yeah. Okay. All right. We are adjourned. <laughs>